It is 9.20 on January 12th. Incredible. Middle of January already, 2023. I'm uh, Commissioner Ed Rothstein and um, got a pretty lengthy agenda to go through um, this morning. Without further ado, why don't we start with the Pledge of Allegiance in a moment of silence. Okay, <clears throat> and I think uh, the first thing we need to do is recognize the wonderful audience we have out in front of us and those on TV land, <clears throat> but also uh, Ms. Stella, I guess it is a Ms. and not a Miss or Mrs., uh, from our wonderful Boys and Girls Club um, that is overwatching our lawyer if he ever gets here but he will i'm sure and uh i still think there's eyes on all of us she has that da vinci mona lisa look where you never know where she's looking so uh but um she is a symbol of our boys and girls club here in westminster that does phenomenal work in our community and uh commissioner gordon just leaving the board That's right correct. that is correct uh, my uh, two terms were up and uh has been a part of this community uh with the boys and girls club so i applaud uh your work with them and all the work uh that the boys and girls club does for our community um here in carroll county um okay let's start with uh priority carol you kind of scare me over there mr vigliotti so i'll start with mr gordon good morning well as Commissioner uh, Rothstein already said, we can address the elephant, or should I say giraffe, in the room this morning. Um, obviously, we'd like to welcome Stella from Boys and Girls Club of Westminster. She's uh, touring both Carroll County, uh, both uh, businesses as well as uh, other organizations. She's been to the Carroll Community College, uh, the City of Westminster as well, and uh, numerous businesses to date. Uh, part of this was just something to allow the uh, children of the club to interact on social media and see where Stella is going, what she's interacting with, and, and who she's meeting with. Um, it might have already been mentioned, but uh, she's already had her HR orientation and has her own uh, county ID badge. <laughs> um, but uh, moving on from that topic, I uh, needed to mention the passing of a friend to many of us in this county who left a significant mark on our community. That would be agricultural leader and friend Bob Jones, who passed away on Tuesday, December 27th at the age of 93. Bob was a pillar and preserver of the agricultural community whose legacy will not be forgotten. Uh, he graduated from Highland High School and then he attended the University of Maryland. We received a bachelor's of science and a master's degree. Uh, he also served in the U.S. Air Force during the Korean War. Bob became the Carroll County Agricultural Extension agent in 1957, serving at that role until he retired in 1984. During his time as county agent, he worked primarily with farmers and youth in 4-H. As a community leader, he served on Carroll County boards such as Planning Commission and Economic Development Commission. In 67, Bob established the Agricultural Business Club, uh, which meets monthly to this day. He helped us establish the Carroll County Farm Museum, the Farmer's Market, and helped with the planning of Camp Poshua. He was a Distinguished Service Award winner and past president of the Maryland Association of County Agricultural Agents, past president of the National Association of County Agricultural Agents, and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2009. He was also past president of the Kiwanis Club of Westminster and named a Hickson Fellow in 2002. Bob was a self selfless advocate to the, for the preservation of ag in our community. He was also active uh, with the Agricultural Center, the Maryland Farm Bureau, and the Maryland Dairy Herd Improvement Association. But uh, one of his many accomplishments was to raise $430,000 to move and restore the Hoff Log Barn, which resides at our Carroll County Farm Museum. Uh, we will miss Bob's generosity and deeply acknowledge all his uh, involvement in our community. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. If you haven't been out there to see that barn, that Hoff Barn, it's it's awesome you know uh 
and just like everything I think we do in Carroll County and uh, how well we do is because of the community like Bob and those that serve with him. Um, pretty, I appreciate that. He meant a lot. Uh, Commissioner Kyler, what's on your mind? Um, thank you, everyone. I, I, I'll try to keep it brief. We do have a, a, a decent agenda today. Um, but a couple of things I want to mention. We did have MAKO's Winter Conference, and like a couple of us, my first experience. But they are a great group. It was great networking there, and and uh, uh, it's you, you learn a lot from it, and, and it, it's really good. And uh, and I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce for the State of the County on Monday and the uh, the day with uh, Leadership Carol and what they do with Leadership Carol and so many other things. Um, again, like I say, we, and we met, we did our joint meeting with the Board of Ed, I think a very positive meeting and a positive discussion. I've met with a couple of different committees and uh, some, some directors and some staff and uh, I'm learning and uh, hopefully I can do that quickly, but uh, I really appreciate um, the people I've met and the people I've talked to. Thank you. No, I, I appreciate it. Before uh, Commissioner Vigliotti, Mr. Burke, we all gave reference to uh, Miss Stella. So either a handshake, a hug, uh, <laughs> a song, a poem, you you know, okay. <laughs> Just showing the love, okay, and respect that Stella deserves. Uh, Mr. Vigliotti. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner. I will uh, truncate my remarks this morning in the interest of the lengthy agenda that we have. Uh, so very briefly, uh, last week I spent some time with our awesome Sheriff Jim DeWeese uh, touring the buildings that he oversees, touring the, the jail. And uh, I was incredibly impressed by the uh, proficiency and the professionalism of the men and women who uh, operate that place and the men and the women who serve under him. I had the privilege of attending the swearing in of our new state's attorney, Haven Shoemaker. I know he is a good guy. He's committed to law and order, and that's the kind of thing that our county depends on for uh, our quality of life. And I know that we're all looking forward to working with him in the coming years. Um, skipping ahead a little bit because you know there are some things that have already been touched on. Um, I just wanted to uh, make mention uh, last here uh, that a one of our previous uh, city council members in Tawnytown, Carl Ebaugh, passed away over the weekend. Uh, he was an old school guy in every in all of the best ways. Uh, he was an army veteran. Uh, he had incredible common sense wisdom, and he was a good friend. He was always supportive, always ready to lend a helping hand if something was needed. Uh, he had served on the city council for years, and in 2016, when I was still a member of the council. Uh, we had a vacancy after one of the other council members retired, and, and we asked Carl to, to come back. And, and the way that I kind of looked at it was he was this you know, retired general or retired statesman, retired soldier who was coming out one last time to, to fill in a gap. Uh, and even with filling out the rest of that term, he made a uh, tremendous difference in the town. I'll be uh, attending his uh, viewing this afternoon, and uh, you know, I, I certainly pray for his family and, and glad that he is now in heaven uh, and uh, commissioner that's it for me this morning thank you okay thank you um, <clears throat> let commissioner Garen get settled uh, for priority Carol for me just a couple of things Carroll County continues to lead the way in uh, our unemployment statistics we're at 2.7 percent where the state is at 3.7 uh, so um, our workforce development our community college exploration commons uh, CCPS um, it's not one or the other it's all together that you know puts forward the success of this unemployment uh, statistics the backbone of our uh, community as often said is um, small business and small business development uh, I always believe in getting things done for free so the Small Business Administration has counselors underneath what's called the SBDC, uh, Small Business Development Corporation. We have that representation here in Carroll County. And uh, to date, no, not to date, they have uh, valued loans and equity financing of over $4.5 million to small businesses. Um, they've supported almost 200 jobs here in Carroll County counseled over 80 in this I apologize this is FY 23 uh, 22 um, 83 clients and 
48 new clients. Um, sometimes people feel like they're hard to find. Anytime, anytime somebody feels like something's hard to find, reach out to one of us and we will navigate you to the right place. I guarantee it. You know, this is not a part-time job. This is a full-time commitment, and that's the way I believe me and all my colleagues see this. Uh, and that full-time commitment was really shown this past week with uh, Maryland Association of Counties. Um, I will continue uh, to participate with Commissioner Kyler uh, starting on Wednesdays during legislative session, and the county will be uh, continue to be represented as I was selected to be on the board of directors for um, MAKO. The state of the county, as I, I shared, um, the excitement to me is looking at what's on the dais today is the diversity from backgrounds, from ages, from lots of different, um, you know, ways we look at, look at things. And, uh, and I really enjoy that. And I'm really looking forward to 2023 uh, being a strong, uh, prosperous year. Um, the last thing, it's going to be tough. It may be long and prosperous, but it's going to be a tough year. And the Board of Education uh, joint meeting yesterday highlighted just that. We were very professional, we were very candid, but we were also very upfront uh, saying we got a long ways to go. And, um, you know, our participation in the Board of Education meetings, along with the joint meetings, along with the outreach that are formal and informal, will get us, you know, where we need to go. But we, we have some, <clears throat> we have a lot of work to do uh, in, in getting there. Um, Really appreciate the uh, superintendent, uh, Cindy McCabe, along with um, the Board of Education being being there yesterday for the joint meeting. They are committed uh, for our community and most importantly for our children. So uh, really appreciate the time spent uh, with them yesterday afternoon. Okay, uh, Commissioner Guerin. What's on your mind? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, I'm sure it was probably already mentioned uh, when we had our State of the County on Tuesday, and then we met with Leadership Carol uh, during the day and had a Q&A session. I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce for that. Uh, but what struck me about the Leadership Carol interaction for lunch and the Q&A was, was just how intently people were listening. Uh, I mean, they're being polite, but they're also listening. They want to hear what we have to say. Uh, relatively new board. Uh, new year, um, a lot of decisions to make. Uh, I think I'm, I'm encouraged that we're moving forward and uh, bright-eyed and optimistic and, and also willing to take a look at some of the previous decisions from other commissioner boards that were made at the time they were made. It's, it's, it's the way it is, but everything can be looked at. Everything can be reviewed. I'm encouraged by that. Uh, you know, the commissioners were, were elected to lead if we don't make these types of decisions, somebody's <clears throat> going to make them for us. So um, just encouraged by that all that day in general, but just really struck by how intently people were interested in what's going on in the county. And that was encouraging for me because that's that's really what I want to see. So that was it. That's really it. Thank and you. I appreciate it. And you actually said it very well that the rubber meets the road at local government and every vote counts. And and that's, you know, we heard that from Senator Carr, didn't figure out all about that. We met with him on Monday uh, for an hour, and he gave us his uh, full attention for an hour. And one of the commitments, he said that he'll continue to work with us, but the facts are where the rubber meets the road, like you said, Commissioner Guerin, is at local government, and he highlighted that as well. So um, appreciate it. Okay. Now, let's get right into our open session. Our first item is an update, a recommended update to the Veterans Advisory Council bylaws. Ms. Deckel, I think you're coming up here with Ms. Gina, Mr. Bill Nash, and the one who actually runs everything, Ms. Lawrence. <laughs> All right. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. I am joined this morning uh, with Gina Valentine, our Bureau Chief of Aging and Disabilities, Roberta Lawrence, we, who goes by Bobby. Um, she is our Aging and Disability Services Supervisor, and then Bill Nash, who is the Chair of our Veterans Advisory Council. This morning, we're before you seeking uh, approval to update 
um, for a recommended update to our Veterans uh, Advisory Council bylaws. Each of you have been provided a copy of the current bylaws as they are written um, and executed um, in your board packet um, for your reference. I'm going to turn it over to Gina to walk us through what the recommended um, update to the bylaws includes. Mm -hmm. Um, good morning. So on December 20th at the Veterans Advisory Council meeting, there was a discussion about the bylaws and um, in particular Article 5 um, regarding membership number 13. Um, council may, members may not serve as, board, as a board member of the Veterans Independence Project, um, otherwise known as the VIP. Um, and during that meeting, um, the council voted and approved a recommendation to the commissioners to remove that article from the Veterans Advisory Council bylaws. Was there a reason why that was there in the first place? One of the, I, I believe the true reason was um, we haven't updated the bylaws since the Veterans Independence Project has been up and running. And um, initially, the Veterans Independence Project was a recommended initiative under the initial Veterans Advisory Council mm -hmm. group. So in order to not muddy the waters while that separation and the Veterans Independence Project was becoming its own entity and to keep the two committees, if you would, separate, mm -hmm. this was developed um, and recommended by everyone that was working on both sides of those projects to make sure that um, it was a streamlined process. And, and it is true and timely to, to make this update. Okay, um, so it was recommended at time by everybody involved. After moving forward, it's now you know, time to move forward. Uh, Mr. Nash, do you have any comments on this? Well, the board voted to approve that. I personally think that we should keep them independent of each other. Um, I'm only one vote, uh, but uh, <clears throat> it has been approved, and I think okay. that's the way we go. Okay. Bobby, any comments? I agree. It seems like it's antiquated in the, in the bylaws, so I'm okay with it being removed as well. Yeah, and for me, you know, getting the guidance, nobody knows Carroll County better than Carroll Countyans, and that's why we have these councils and boards, you know, so taking the guidance from the majority of these boards means a lot, you know, as opposed to us up here saying we will do it this way or not. So um, I'll move the Board of County Commissioners to approve. If I could. Let, I let, me, let me just make okay. a motion, and then we'll go from there to second and then discussion. Mm -hmm. Uh, move the Board of County Commissioners approve the revision to the Veterans Advisory Council bylaws. Second. Okay. I got a motion. I got a second. Now open for discussion. I have a couple questions regarding this. Um, number one, have we ever historically, to your knowledge, done this with any other organizations or individuals in the past? I know we obviously this discussion was that it was collaboratively done between those two parties but do we do this in any other variety of our councils or boards because you know we deal with a wide berth of people as we all know whether it be veterans whether it be children's service groups whether it be any type of entity have we ever done this in the past to my knowledge and, and I don't have the comprehensive knowledge of everything um, I've been with the county for 11 years but I, I don't I don't recall that we have, but I think in this scenario, I also don't know um, from a commissioner developed advisory council that we've ever had a split with a, them developing a nonprofit. So I'm not sure um, if this was kind of a very one off kind of specific um, process. So I, I, I don't know of any other process where we've identified something this specific um, in a bylaw, though. Okay. It just kind of raises some concerns for me because we, as a county, have always been very interactive, be it government, be it private industry, be it nonprofits, or just average individuals that want to volunteer. And I find it very troubling that this occurred let to anybody. I don't, it's not specifically this group. It's about anybody. Um, and you, what, what really troubles me is we have a wide berth of nonprofits in this community. We have people that are starting them on a daily basis. I have people calling me up that want to meet and they have, they have a desire to serve and help the community. And what concerns me heavily is that does this ever occur again, which one I would hope it does not. Um, I'd also like to point out though, and this does dovetail into this conversation, that I spent about 20 hours going through the bylaws and commissions of all these groups over the past month or two, actually long, actually before we actually got seated. And this isn't apropos strictly to you all, but we have some very interesting uh, 
conflicts and inconsistencies within all of our bylaws for all of these groups. There are things that in one we will make a statement that it falls under the commissioner's purview and another it does not. Um, my question this morning, while I think we do need to clean this matter up and remove this, I would like to see us seriously consider not only include that, but I think we need to look at doing a 60-day review of all our boards, all our commissions, have our staff look at these and go from there. We're doing that already. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned that some time ago. We're putting together um, information on all the boards and commissions mm -hmm. for the commissioners to review and with staff, et cetera. Okay. So, yes. Yeah. So, being a part of the Veterans Advisory Council for quite some time, um, I mean, I was asked to participate on it from former Commissioner Howard. I didn't even know what the Veterans Advisory Council, or for that matter, Carroll County government was at that point as I was running installation. Um, but then participating, and then um, I did know Ed Kramer very well uh, because of his work at Johns Hopkins and getting to know Frank Valenti. Um, with them in establishing the CCVIP was very important. It was like top of my list uh, to do. And, uh, you know, working with um, federal government, GSA, about the building and, and establishing. Um, I am 100% in support of taking care of our veteran community. And, Bill, you know that very well. Um, you know, whether we miss something or not in, in initial bylaws for this, this is something I was not a part of, you know. Uh, and I think we grew out of it. So it's time to update, and just like uh, Commissioner Gordon said, there, we do things for the right reasons with the information we have at the time. Um, whether or not it should stand the test of time or not, you only know that by having the ability to review and having the time to step back and objectively review the rules and the bylaws. And if things need to be changed, they need to be changed. These bylaws were written and designed by you know the uh the head of the vip right with uh mr valenti and mr kramer and the uh, vac at that time i think actually frank was the head of the vac or at that <laughs> time yeah, um so <clears throat> there was no you know there was no miscommunications there was no you know I, i've seen again in the, in the newspaper discriminatory you know thoughts about this it was a decision made with the information we had at the time taking a look at it now changing it you know whether some dissent from it or disagree that's regardless it's what does the majority of the organization that's like with us if we count to three we're good you know and if i dissent on a decision i own up to the decision if the majority you know right. says that's and that's exactly what you're doing bill and i appreciate that um but uh yeah i just want to be very clear that um i was not part of the bylaws but i was part of standing up a very important agency and a, a non-profit called the vip for the right reasons um and that's taking care of our veterans how that changes and morphs over time you know we're one community and we got to look at ourselves that way um and we've had this conversation a lot and i'm very animate about it because of my commitment to our veteran community and carroll county um so but i i do agree let's take a look at the bylaws that's and if overall we have lots of committees and lots of organizations and that's what you know we're doing so Okay, were you going to come in? I apologize. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm, um, I kind of don't care about the history or the consistency with other groups. I, I look at that, that I think this was done when it was done to keep the two groups independent so they could develop the best they could. And, and I appreciate that decision. I think it was uh, mutual at the time. Um, I've been involved with a lot of group with with bylaws and most groups every year there's some amendments and some changes because times change mm -hmm. feelings change um the most depressing ones and i'm sure carroll county doesn't have that 
I've been in a group that's had bylaws for 20 years and you correct grammar and misspellings that have been in it for 20 <laughs> years and nobody noticed. Um, so so it's, it's understandable. I, I do understand Mr. Nash in saying maybe it's not even time to do it because I, I think it's very important to show the independence of the two groups. But I think that's been established and, and I think it probably is time to do it. Okay. Anything else? Okay, I have a, a motion on the floor and a second. No further discussion. All in, all in favor of the action of removing uh, Article 5, TAC 13. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, against? Hearing none. Um, we do have opportunity for public comment. Is there any public comment on this? Okay, let's move on to Item number two. Thank you, guys. Item number two, fall you. amendment. Thank you. Come on up, Ms. Eisenberg. And Price, is there, where is he at? Or is it just you? On fall amendment to the 2019 Water and Sewer Master Plan. Good morning, commissioners. As uh, President Rostein has said, the purpose of the next segment is for you to solicit public comment on some proposed amendments to the 2019 Water and Sewer Master Plan. Uh, commenters during these uh, public hearing process are typically limited to three minutes and uh, prior to taking public comment the board generally uh, asks for some information about the proposed amendments and some background as with us as staff uh, today um, is director Linda Eisenberg from our Department of Planning if you have any would you like to give us a little background and sure I'll give a brief presentation just to refresh your memory unfortunately mr. Wagner is unable to be with us today so you're stuck with me to present this information to you um, again as mr. Burke said we are here for the water and sewer fall 22 amendment um, to the water and sewer master plan we went before the Planning Commission on November 2nd of 2022 to recommend to you, this body, um, the amendment to the Water and Sewer Master Plan. And we came before you all, if you recall, a month ago, believe it or not, on December 12th, I um, gave you a presentation to request to go to public hearing, which is today. Um, as we required under Comar, this has been posted in the Carroll County Times for two consecutive weeks. This is a clip of the public hearing advertisement. It was um, in the December 29th and January 5th, 2023 public hearing notice. So again, these are just amendments. So we update this plan every three years as we're required to under state law. We also process amendments twice a year, typically once in the spring and once in the fall. The reason for these amendments are things come up from time to time where property owners need to either come out of the service area for various reasons or properties need to come into the service area for various reasons. Typically, if there's a failing system um, and it's easy for them to hook up to water and sewer and they don't have an ability to either expand um, their well and septic tanks that um, we can bring them into the system. So today we have three map amendments. The first map amendment is for the Freedom Sykesville area, and that's both water and sewer service. The Hampstead water and sewer service area and Manchester water service only. The Freedom Sykesville area is completely under the county's control for allocating water and sewer service. We work with Maryland Environmental Services, MES, for our wastewater treatment, and we withdraw our water out of the Liberty Reservoir for this area. Hampstead's a little unique. Um, the city runs the water system and the county runs the sewer system in this particular area, but we work hand in hand with the town of Hampstead um, in the planning and allocation of the water and sewer service for that area. Um, and then Manchester is its own sole provider of both water and sewer. Um, in addition to map amendments, there is an amendment um, to a chapter for the city of Westminster and our table 15, which is a water a table that shows you allocations. I'll get to that further on in the presentation. But this is specifically for Westminster's water service area. And this is relating to the Westminster Water Resource Facility, which is a pilot study for a new water reuse facility. Um, it was a request under Maryland Department of the Environment that this 
facility amendment be added to the document so that's consistent with the water and sewer master plan so be, this happened at the end of um, August in 2022 they requested to come forward to process this portion in this amendment the new water reuse facility project um, will continue to move forward as the city awaits design and permit completion there are representatives from the city here today if you have additional questions regarding um, this chapter which you all should have in your staff report that came before you all um, so for the map changes for the Freedom Sykesville area taking these four parcels um, which are known as um, for um, I'm sorry the Stockdale Smith properties um, 411 Liberty Road moving from the long range which is the hatched area into priority sewer service area this was able to happen because of some reallocation of underutilized um, capacity in the freedom area that we were able to redistribute to these properties um, the estimated demand for these properties based on the calculation were required to use by maryland department of the environment um, is 8,400 gallons per day for all four parcels. The proposal will use a portion, as I said, of the un underutilized demand for the Zabel property, given the density reduction in the last comprehensive rezoning. The ability to use the, utilize this demand reduces additional demand developing these properties that would bring to the system. We always run a real tight balance of what we have. We have everything allocated for the system. Um, so in order to bring new properties in, reallocations have to occur. And that's why this prop these series of properties were able to be brought in and still keep the system where it needs to be for water and um, for sewer demand. Um, in addition, four other parcels are coming in, which is actually just um, to the east of the properties that you saw in the Freedom area. These are across from Century High School, more or less. Um, and the proposal is to utilize a portion again of that underutilized demand um, and the reason that these need to connect is that they are having um, issues with struggling septic systems and do not have the ability to put new septic in um, several of the parcels actually have existing businesses on them that are having issues and then other parts portions more toward um, the western portion of the kind of triangle parcels are undeveloped at this time so they would have um, 5,600 gallons per day allocated to them to be able to um, redevelop and develop these sites. That's um, the pizza place where Stafford's is. Correct. Taekwondo that yes. across the street from Highs. Right, and the idea is um, the property to the west, um, the Stavlis property, um, which is actually uh, has an approved site plan for a planned commercial center on that site. They are also in the water and sewer service area. Um, the property owners to the west are working with them and they would use it as the conduit to connect to the um, municipal system for the county. Um, but it happened just to be good timing for them that that was moving forward as well so they can tap into that and um, you know get out of their struggling septic system issues. Okay. Next, um, 5591 Linton Road. Um, this was an emergency connection due to a failing septic system. The property owner um, felt they wanted to be on public water, public sewer for this particular site. Um, it was challenging for them to get an additional septic system put in and it was just as cost effective um, and better in the long run to be part of the city system, I mean the municipal system for Carroll County. Um, and so this, changing of the map does not really move the needle in the tables because it's one property 250 gallons per day so we did not update the table because of that we just um, showed it on the map and I believe that they are already connected to the system because again it was an emergency situation so they needed to move forward so now we're just coming back and making that change consistent with the plan I um, mean, at the same time, they decided to go for water as well, which made perfect sense. So they also moved into the water service area now are on uh, public water and public sewer. And again, this is in the Freedom area. Um, so this larger map here shows where the two um, main properties are. The third one is really small. It's over in this area off of um, Linton. So um, we didn't outline it on the map, but this general northwestern quadrant of the freedom areas where the updates are occurring and as you can see we're pretty fully allocated um, there's not a lo lot of room for additional growth the hatched means that um, 
maybe in the long range, 10 plus years, if we do upgrades to the system, there would be a possibility to extend service to those properties. Some are undeveloped and some are developed, so we will be retrofitting in systems to those sites. Um, the light green is a seven to 10 year. And then the priority means you can hook up today and turn on the water and it'll be available. Once the site's fully built out, we move that to the existing final planning, which is the darker green. So as you can see, most of the freedom area is in existing final planning, so there's not a lot to allocate an addition for additional development at this time. Um, the Manchester area had an amendment they sent in as well. Um, this is to remove the I coal. I apologize. Linda. I'm sorry. That Sykesville, is there no changes or requests? For the town of Sykesville? No. Okay. Nope. Okay, thanks. Um, so for the Manchester area is to remove the Colt Rider property at 2900 Hanover Pike um, and 2419 Hanover Pike from the projected water supply demand. And this will also change um, table 15 as well, placing these properties in the long range. This is a request from them to be moved. We don't just move properties. Um, in the county or in the municipalities without the landowner's consent on that. So this is one that was brought forward by the town of Manchester, working with the landowner to move them out of that um, long range. Um, and then move the long range, ex move 2912 Manchester LLC at 2912 Hanover Pike property from long range to existing as well, because they are both currently being served. So this is to bring the maps up to date. Um, and then next, the town of Hampstead requested the addition of 630 Hanover Pike to the Priority Water Service Area. The property is currently in use and is served by public water and private wells. So this would bring them onto public water. The property is in the beginning stages of being annexed into the town. Um, all of our municipalities do require, um, except for the city of Westminster, to be in the corporate limits in order to be served with municipal water and or sewer. Um, although the, ta the total area of the property is 52 acres, the potential ga um, gallon demand, 52 acres times 800, <laughs> is 46, 41,600 gallons. The priority water uh, demand is based on the existing sewer usage, which is an average of 500 gallons per day. And this is the Random House site. Um, and currently, uh, they are on uh, private water. So this is to get them onto the public system. And they've been working with the city and uh, obviously um, the uh, city of Manchester, town of Manchester, to move this, Hampstead, I'm sorry, to move this forward. Mm -hmm. um, nextly, in the Hampstead area is to move 1734 Hanover Pike from the future to the priority service on the Hampstead sewer service area map. The property has been used as a self storage with a small office. The amount of water demand um, is minimal as calculated in table 32. So therefore, again, because it's so small, there was no need to update the larger demand tables, um, but to update the map to be um, in correspondence with how the property is being used. Um, so these are the tables. I'm not going to go over each number, but this is what we're submitting to Maryland to the Department of the Environment for their review to make sure that they're good with how the numbers fill out for um, the demand and capacity to supply water and sewer service to these properties. So um, we typically give you a recommended motion. This is a legislative um, public hearing, so we would leave the record open for 10 days. Mm -hmm. Um, after um, today's meeting to take in additional comments. We have not received any comments to date. So with that, um, Tim, is there anything else we need to do for the public hearing this morning? No, unless the commissioners have any <laughs> questions. Or are there any questions, discussion? I do have um, getting comments about disabled property and the reallocation of water sewer. Mm -hmm from the Zabel property to these other properties. Um, I get confused. I mean, maybe it's because I'm a simple-minded person, but I get confused on what the folks are trying to really tell me. Are they saying that the allocation of water and sewer is not uh, there appropriate for development in Zabel property? What, what, what's the gist of what, because I've sent some of that to you as well. I to sure. So um, the Zabel property in the Freedom 2018 plan. I, I, I apologize. Zabel <coughs> property is between Ridge Road, Marysville 2 in the uh, southern part of uh, the Freedom District, uh, kind of to the south. Um, right of here. Walmart. It's, if 
you look at um, these yeah. later patch of properties here to the southeast, it's this clumping here, right. the furthest yeah. ones to the eastern, southeastern portion. It's a, it's a large property uh, for residential opportunity, but go ahead, I'm sorry. Sure, so when the Freedom Plan was developed in 2018, the calculations were based on the future land use designation of residential medium, which is our R20,000 district. We did comprehensive rezone, I'm sorry, let me back up. When we did the plan, we made sure at that time that the land use designations had the proper corresponding infrastructure to make those come to reality in the future. So we weren't allocating or designating things that we knew we couldn't serve with public infrastructure. So therefore, you know, we did the math and saw that we could supply those properties at that density um, with water and sewer service. Fast forward, we did a comprehensive rezoning um, of all the properties that were to be in a concert with their master plan as a by request. So property owners could come forward and say, now I wish to be in agreement during this time frame that we set out with the master plan. So the property owner of the Zabel property came forward wishing to be rezoned to R20,000 um, to be in alignment with the freedom plan. Um, at that time, um, the Board of County Commissioners did not feel it was appropriate to rezone those properties. Um, so instead of moving to their R20,000 designation, they stayed at their current R40,000 designation, which is half the amount, essentially. So half of that allocation and under a site plan has now been freed up, so to speak, that can be reallocated to other parts of the freedom area. I would say this, because it's not built yet, you wouldn't want to hang your hat on one property being the linchpin to add other properties. There were other changes within the freedom area that have also taken place to free up additional capacity. So it wasn't solely based on that decision, we had capacity in other ways from how other properties had been utilized and actuals over the last several years that rebalanced um, the freedom area that also made it possible to redistribute that small amount. Yep. No, that said very well. Um, it just gets garbled. Yeah, I apologize, Commissioner. No, 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 that's all right. Just a general question. Um, you'd mentioned that, uh, or I guess my question is, at what point or at what amount uh, does a change in GPD necessitate the tables to be updated? Because I guess I'm, the way that I'm looking at this is that if we have these minimal changes, uh, but they're not reported over time, I mean, at what point does that add up to become sure. problematic? Absolutely. And so they will be. So we rebalance this all the time. Um, whenever we do an amendment, we update the tables based on actual demand and things like that. So this is estimated demand. Um, we don't know what the actual is until they've started up and running. We do this plan in its entirety every three years as we're required uh, to by Comar. So at that three year threshold as well, we pull in all new actual data. So that'll move the needle in one way or another. But because they're in the thousands, <laughs> decimal places, you know, a, a, a small amount's not gonna change that number with the rounding. And you know That's that why. if they're falling between, if yeah. they're fall under the range that we're, ex okay. Correct. That's correct. So um, as you'll see, we'll be before you hopefully by June of this year with the extra triennial update, which is kind of, let's clean all this up, restart, and now you'll see the additive um, over the last several years be recalculated and calibrated. And so it's kind of like that, resetting the base for things because usage fluctuates over time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Of course. Okay. So, um, to ask if there's any comments from the public at this time. Uh, is there anybody in the room <clears throat> want to comment? Uh, Chris, we have no one. On, we have no one on the line. But if Linda could pull back the the virtual window so we can run the timer, that would be great. Yeah, but Chris, you're not supposed to say that until I ask you. So, okay. So there's no one on the line, and there's no one in the uh, in the room. What I do need now is a motion to close the public hearing and keep the record open for 10 days. So moved. I got a motion. Second. I got a motion second. Any further discussion on this? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Great, thank you. Thank you. I'm still here. <laughs> <coughs> okay, let's go. Where are we at? Um, oh, rezoning case 
229 the Hutton Street, no, Mr. 21 LLC, Department of Plan, uh, Linda and Hannah. Take it away. Yes, all right, commissioners, I have with me today Hannah Weber, who is a comprehensive planner in the Department of Planning. Um, and we're here before you today to request to go to a public hearing for a zoning map amendment or um, commonly known as a piecemeal rezoning. Um, this will be your first time as a board having this type of public hearing, so we wanted to give you a brief overview of what this means. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Hannah. This is different than a comprehensive approach. Um, this is also different than the last public hearing that you just had, which was a legislative public hearing because we're changing a document. This will be more of a quasi-judicial type of public hearing where you'll be sitting um, more as a, 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 a jury, so to speak, um, and uh, there will be testimony given during that time. So um, with that, there are piecemeal rezonings and there are zoning, I mean, um, and there are comprehensive rezonings. So if Hannah, you can go ahead and go over your presentation, that'd yep. be great. Good morning, everybody. As Linda introduced, since we have four new commissioners with us, we wanted to give a quick overview of piecemeal rezonings, what they are, and some things to think about when you're making your ultimate decision in the end. So as Linda said, there are two, only two ways to rezone a property in Maryland. And as Linda kind of went over, there's one through the comprehensive rezoning process. And then two is through a piecemeal rezoning process. And that is what we will be discussing today. Piecemeal rezonings are applicant driven and it's usually the property owner or the contract purchaser of the property and they will apply to have their subject property zoning changed. The request to change the zoning via piecemeal rezoning must be based on one or both of the following arguments and that is that a substantial change occurred in the character of the neighborhood or that there was a mistake in the existing zoning classification. And that is taken from the Maryland land use articles that is bigger than Carroll County as it is a state um, level law. So some more highlights, these are bullet points taken from a Maryland Department of Planning education course. The change or mistake rule puts a difficult burden of proof on the applicant for a piecemeal rezoning. The legislative body shall find that the rezoning is consistent with the comprehensive plan and that the current zoning was applied in error or that a change in the neighborhood has occurred. So that further speaks to the change or mistake arguments needed. And then lastly, even if the argument of change or mistake is proven by the applicant, the lo local government does not have to grant the request to rezone. So that basically means even in the end, if um, you as commissioners find that there was a change in the neighborhood or a mistake in the current zoning, you still don't have to rezone the property. You're not compelled to do so. So if there's no questions on the piecemeal rezonings, I can go ahead and get started with the rezoning for today. Any questions on process? No. no. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So for, for today, we have rezoning case number 229, Hutton Street 21 LLC. We are located in the Freedom Designated Growth Area. Just We are north of Maryland 26 and east of the Georgetown Boulevard and Maryland 26 intersection. The request to rezone is 1.931 acres from R20,000 residential medium to C2 commercial medium. The applicant is arguing that there is a mistake in the current zoning classification. And then here is the zoning of the property and the surrounding area. As you can see, the property is split zoned between C2 commercial medium and R20,000 residential medium. The request to rezone is only for the rear portion of the property, the part that's zoned R20,000. So ultimately, if you as commissioners feel you want to rezone this property to C2, the entire parcel would then become C2 commercial medium. So to date, at the December 13th Planning Commission meeting, they gave a favorable recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners. Today we are here for an introduction, which I just gave, and as Linda said, a request to go to public hearing. We have a tentative public hearing scheduled for February 2nd. This will be for staff and applicant arguments, as well as time for public comment. We will have a discussion with the, um, the Board of County Commissioners and the applicant and staff, and then a possible decision if you are ready at that time. And then if you are not, um, we have time scheduled for February 9th for a decision. And part of that process is the property be, will be signed 
So visually on the property, there'll be signage um, notifying the community of a public hearing regarding the rezoning of this property, as well as we send letters to the adjoining parcels. However, in this case, since it's so dense, we're actually sending them even further out um, into the community to make sure that they're aware of this change. Okay. And then it'll be posted in the newspaper as well. Thank you. Yep. Okay, is there any uh, questions on this one? Uh, I know this is still early in the process, mm -hmm. but I can't imagine that people on North Walnut are too too happy about this. And I haven't read through every history, piece of history on this property, but if this does proceed, I would hope that the owner understands that there's going to have to be some sort of screening or something mm -hmm. pretty major to... Uh, to help this along because this particular property, I mean, it's it's smack dab in the middle of our 20,000. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just the mm -hmm. pictures, pictures don't lie. So I'll be, I'll be looking for that. So at that time, um, there's no site plan that's being submitted with this. So it would be really hard to tell what the actual final product will be. So, but we do have a robust development review process where in this type of situation, um, the planning commission has the latitude to require additional screening and buffers from the local community right now it's an empty lot in the back portion yes in the yes. front portion it is i don't even know if the gas station, the gas station. is still station. open yeah, yeah. It it's the gas station yep. it, but right behind it's an empty lot mm -hmm. yep. residential on the right on the east and then um, commercial on the, yeah. the stores are on the left mm -hmm. on the correct on and the there's residential side. in the back yes yeah and, and, and there's empty also lot. residential mm -hmm. that's correct yeah. but yeah okay yeah um I mean, that's okay. Any uh, any other uh, discussion on this? Do I hear a motion? Where is this thing? For motion. Sure. Um, I move the Board of County Commissioners oh, schedule a public oh, hearing for rezoning case Did number two two nine. Public. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Did Did I think we might have somebody who wanted to make public Probably comment. Probably is, yeah. I would imagine. So okay. Did you, I? I mean, we could, yeah. So is you there, do that before the motion. We, we can have public comment now. It doesn't matter. I mean, we're going to public hearing, but yes, do you have public comment? Sure. Why don't you come on up? <clears throat> no, excuse me. The, the mic behind you. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> and just uh, do me a favor, state, state your name where you're. Sure. Living. My name is Jennifer Crowley, and I am a resident of North Walnut Avenue. Uh -huh. And I received the letter. We attended the meeting at the gas station with the developers on their intentions. And I have spoken with many of my neighbors. We are not in favor of this change. Um, we have that lot back there. It is a great buffer between the commercial area and the gas station. And we're concerned that you know it's going to cause disruption to our daily lives. It's going to bring in you know people that could be trespassing, loitering, putting our children in danger. Um, and uh, you know, we just are very concerned about this whole thing, that it's going to decrease our property value. I don't think most people would want a car wash in their backyard, which is what their intention is to build. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay. Is there any other discussion? I appreciate the comments. Um, any other comments um, and I too appreciate the comments and just for clarification all we're doing today is scheduling public hearing to allow for more public comment exactly correct right yep so you ready for the motion sure. now I move the Board of County Commissioners schedule public hearing for rezoning case number 229 Button Street 21 LLC Okay, I'll second that. Is there any uh, discussion? Further discussion? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, thought? Commissioners. Thank okay. you. Yep. Okay. Get myself organized. Okay, let's talk about North Carroll Library Stormwater Management Facility Renovation. Go 
Yes, good morning, morning Commissioners. Chris? Okay. Yes, morning. yeah, before we get into the hearing, wanted to give, kind of set the stage a little bit for this. So the county has a National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Permit, otherwise known as NPDES, and this project relates directly to that. And so that NPDES permit is given to us from the Maryland Department of the Environment, and that stems from the Clean Water Act, the Federal Clean Water Act. And that permit requires us to do so, um, a variety of things, all related to improving the quality of the water in our streams and rivers. So, and we actually just received our fifth generation permit about two weeks ago. So we are planning on coming before you sometime in the near future to give you an overall informational briefing about the whole NPDES program and what the permit requirements are and so on. But in the meantime, our program is continuing along. And so we're here before you uh, related to a project that's specific to that program. Obviously, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have about this project and the program, but I just wanted to let you know that we will be coming back before you again to kind of do a deep dive into the specifics of the overall permit and, and why we do all of these things. So with that, I'll turn it over to Janet O'Meara, who's our Bureau Chief of the Bureau of Resource Management, Ed Singer, who is our Watershed um, Management Coordinator, and I believe you know Carrie from Office of Procurement. Right. I appreciate it, Chris. And, uh <clears throat> Remember, use small words and explain carefully because it is a complex issue that we always deal with and can become very confusing, you know, as we move forward with these type of issues. Yes. So um, education for me will always continue, but also uh, don't believe we've gone through this yet for this, you know, my colleagues. But, okay. Yes, thank Thanks. you. Commissioners, we're here today to ask your approval to request an award to, um, I'm sorry, to award the contract for the North Carroll Li Library Stormwater Management Facility renovation to White Pine Construction Corporation in the amount of $364,003. The Office of Procurement issued a request for bid, received six responses with White Pine Construction Corporation being the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. This amount is within the adopted budget and no additional funds will be necessary. So the, the project we have before you this morning is an existing county-owned stormwater management facility. Uh, the county currently owns over 259 facilities throughout, um, some on properties like the library, senior centers, the majority of which, though, are in residential subdivisions. Uh, we have these facilities on a maintenance plan, um, and we are... I guess within the last 10 years, we have we started that plan. So we're going through and we prioritized the facilities based on when they were constructed and the type of materials that were used. Um, this particular facility is an underground facility or has an underground component to it. And the material that was used when it was initially constructed was corrugated metal pipe. That pipe has the life, life expectancy of around 20 years. Um, it was constructed in 1998. So we, when we inspected it two years ago, there was concerns that we need to do maintenance on it. So we've worked with Carroll Land Service to develop a plan. Um, and as Carrie mentioned, we put the plan out to bid and White Pine is our, is the lowest responsive bidder. So. Commissioners, um, up on the uh, up on the screen, there's a, a location for those of you that might not be familiar with where uh, the North Carroll Library site is. It's uh, it's located uh, just on the opposite side of Hanover Pike from the uh, Hampstead Walmart and uh, the North Carroll Senior Center, and um, just north of the uh, the Weiss. So. Um, the, we're expecting, we, we've been in uh, coordinating with uh, the Bureau of uh, Facilities here in, in, in the county, plus the, uh, the library. Um, the library manager um, of the facility is, is, is aware of, of what we're going to be doing with this project and uh, are on board with uh, the um, construction that's going to be done. We coordinated uh, for the best time of year for them so that it would have minimal impact on their operations. The area that's shown in red here is the uh, limits of disturbance where, the, where this project's going to be done. Uh, we're going to have the uh, contractor fence the area because there's a significant amount of pedestrian traffic in and out of the library, and we just want to make sure that 
that everybody's safe while while this project's ongoing. Um, the the library building uh, is. Uh, it, it's it's that fainter line that's uh, that's outlined there. The the entrance is on the opposite side from where the um, where 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 that red lined area is, where where the construction will be taking place. Right now, you can drive all the way around the building um, when, while this uh, project's under construction. It'll be fenced off, and you'll only be able to come in the entrance off of Eagle Ridge Court, and um, and won't be able to drive the entire way around the facility, but. Uh, we're, we're here today asking for your approval to award this contract. Is it, will there be any disruption to the access driveway that comes in the back that goes to Weiss? The fence will be... No. Th that it'll be outside the fence and there this, will be... This is actually in the parking lot of the, uh, of the library. It's on the back side of the library. That access driveway that you're talking about, you can see it on the, uh, on the plan. It's... it's um, it's it's actually below the uh, the library's property, so it's it that won't be impacted. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? It's a lot of money. Why is the big difference in money between um, white pine and all the rest? Well, I, I believe you know it's only speculation, Commissioner. But uh, one of the contractors had told me that the contractor who has a place to go with there, there's a lot of uh, this is an underground facility is. Uh, Ms. Amira had uh, had referred to, and there's there's a lot of uh, spool that needs to be removed, and they have uh, the contractor who's who's getting this uh, bid has a place to go with the excess fill, and okay. I, I think that makes a difference. Um, that, but we've worked with this contractor before, and yeah. and uh, they they've done good work for us, so we're not concerned that uh, that, that it's. I know you you've told us before that the low bid's not necessarily the best mm -hmm. bid. This is a very reputable contractor who's pre-qualified, and we have full confidence he'll be able to complete and the work. Keeping your locals good. And they've, like they've done other work yeah. at the library site before, so it's not like they don't know what's underground there. They put most of it in. They put it in. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> they told us that. So. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah they, I, I remember watching them. I mean, I, I like keeping it local too. That's that's yep. cool. And Especially I think the person who'll be managing this was was probably about two when they put it in. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any other uh, discussion on this? Okay, I need a motion. Anybody want to make a motion? Motion to approve the Board of Commissioners award the contract for North Carroll Library Stormwater Management Facility renovation to White Pine Construction Corporation Incorporated in the amount of $364,003. Second. I got a motion, I got a second. Any further discussion? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Absolutely. Okay, let's talk about uh, replacing some Xerox copiers. You flying solo? Well, I was hoping in IT. Nope, they're coming. Yeah. Okay. Good morning. Okay, good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, we are here this morning, um, the Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Department of Technology Services, request your approval toward the leasing of two Xerox copiers to Complete Document Solutions MD LLC in the estimated amount of $86,271.96 annually. This cost will cover but is not limited to parts, maintenance, labor, and toner. These machines will be leased via a competitively bid contract through the Pennsylvania Education Purchasing Program for Microcomputers, which is referred to as PEPM, which is a technology cooperative purchasing program. And I'll turn it over to Bobby and Mark to talk about the machines themselves. Morning, Commissioners. I have with me, you probably already have met Bobby several times as she helped you get your computer set up when you came on board. Um, but Ms. Bobby Savaliski is in charge of the Client Services Division of the County and oversees production distribution services. So, Bobby, you want to talk a little bit about the, the equipment? Uh, we currently have two Xerox copiers in the production services area. They, we have a large black and white copier and well, a large color copier and now a smaller black and white because we do less black and white and do more co color these days. Um, we produce quite a bit of um, documents, booklets, and um, 
uh, basically whatever anybody needs, you know, from Westminster or, or from the senior centers, um, sometimes sheriff's department. Uh, they do a lot of um, a lot of different kinds of documents, and these um, devices are high end and um, extremely um, what's the word I want? Cost savings overall at the price per page. I have a question about the process, just so I understand or try to understand. The Technology Cooperative Purchasing Program, it, is that a contract you're piggybacking or you are part of that cooperative? Well, um, both. Both. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is a cooperative program out there. It's been around for many years. And yes, we had to register to join this uh, consortium to take advantage of the discounts that they give us. So we've, we've done both. And I'm imagining, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that, that leasing these uh, printers, or I'm sorry, these copiers, uh, is uh, going to be more cost effective than actually purchase, purchasing them outright ourselves? Mm -hmm. Yes. And that, that has to do with the fact that there are, that there is a, uh, with these leases, there are um, uh, you know, cost coverage that you're talking about, parts, maintenance, labor, et cetera. Covers everything pretty much other than the paper and the staples. Thank you. You're welcome. So it's, it's my understanding that over the five-year period, it's, it's, it's 86K annually but we're leasing these for five years, so it's over four hundred, four hundred thousand dollars to to lease these two. Yes, and it'll ha it'll have to be budgeted in each year. Each year. So and we're I just mean, talking about this year's budget. How badly do we need these? I mean, are we? Yes, it's a, the production distribution services consist of two staff people. Um, as you come in the sliding doors in the basement, they are directly on the right-hand side. Um, they do all of the copy production for large print jobs for the entire county, and as Bobby mentioned, um, for some of our um, partner agencies as well. They are used on a daily basis, if not an hourly basis downstairs. Okay. Any other Comments, discussion? I hear a motion. Motion to award the lease of two Xerox copiers to complete document solutions MD LLC in the amount of $86,271.96 annually. Second. I got a motion, got a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you very much, Thank Commissioners. You. Thank you. Okay, now let's go from copiers to trucks. Morning, Commissioners. Morning. Morning. <coughs> the Office of Procurement and Cooperation with Fleet Management requests your approval to purchase one 2022 F-250 Crew Cab 8-foot bed for $52,504, one 2022 F-250 Crew Cab 6.75-foot bed for $56,779, and one 2022 F-250 Crew Cab 6.75-foot bed <coughs> For $55,149 from Cross Ford of Tawnytown and the total amount of $164,432. This amount is within the approved budget and no additional funds should be necessary. Good morning, Commissioners. Morning. Breaking down this request, two of these trucks are replacement vehicles for the Bureau of Roads Operations and one for the Sheriff's Department. I also brought along some pictures today to illustrate the need for replacement of these vehicles. This first group of pictures is of the road supervisor trucks that we are looking to replace. They are used for the transportation of staff, tools, and materials to and from roads job sites, and they all are also equipped with front snow plows, uh, so they do perform winter weather cleanup. And because of their involvement with road brining and salting, they, they do accumulate an excessive amount of rust, as you can see in the pictures. With the board's approval to purchase the two new trucks, these will be decommissioned and sold through auction. This next picture is of the current vehicle that the Sheriff's Department is using as the Academy Range truck. It does transport uh, some dense items and gear uh, to the range. Uh, the picture is to demonstrate uh, how, 
how much weight is actually placed in the rear of the truck, and you can tell by the way the vehicle is squatting. Uh, this is why we are requesting the purchase of a 2500 series truck. It will better accommodate that excessive weight. Um, this truck is still in excellent condition, so we are not looking to part ways with this truck. We will repurpose it. Uh, currently, there is a 2015 Chevy Tahoe that is used as the mobile field force vehicle in the Sheriff's Department. Uh, it has nearly 150,000 miles, and we are actually looking to replace that anyway. So we'll re repurpose this truck that is pictured, uh, <clears throat> and that Chevy Tahoe will be decommissioned and sent to auction. Um, a little briefing on the uh, process of purchasing, purchasing these vehicles from a local dealer. Uh, unfortunately, the major manufacturers have really limited our ordering uh, potential for trucks. Uh, in working with the procurement office and the budget department, uh, we have determined that uh, best route or solution was to shop for vehicles that were in stock. Fortunately, uh, Krause Ford of Tawnytown has these three vehicles in stock at the moment. They're available for immediate purchase, so with the board's approval, we would expect to have these in our possession uh, by the end of next week. You, an you answered that question. Because <laughs> I was like, what, why are we going to Krause? It's a Sir. first. So, appreciate that. And um, so, uh, Apple and a couple of the others, regional, are limiting purchases. Right, so orders that would be placed yeah. through government contracts, either state or other yeah. local governments, yes, it's very limited. Yeah. Actually, uh, Ford is only allocating three orders for Carroll County government. That order was placed several months ago with the board's approval. Uh, so, yeah, we, we are yep. exhausting all options at this point to make sure we are replacing vehicles as, as was planned. I appreciate the staff work, and, yeah, I mean, you answered that question, so thanks. I have just a general question, and, and you know, if anybody can enlighten me, I'd appreciate that. Um, I know you would mentioned that, that you know, these vehicles that are being decommissioned will be put out to, to auction. So I guess my question is, is when we make a motion to replace vehicles, and I know we did this back in December, but when we make these motions, do we need to include the fact that we want these put out for auction, or is that just standard policy that this is? It's part of our, our required under our procurement obligations. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so okay. they, they, you know, just as we purchase things it was uh, through a very prescribed procurement process we also have to dispose of county property in yep. that same manner basically all right I just wanted to make sure thank you and at some point I guess as we get into budgeting um, I would be very interested in seeing uh, what kind of, of I guess revenue would be the right word is generated through the auctioning of, of these vehicles I'd be very interested in seeing what comes back to us when these are auctioned off I get that. Thank you. I'm sorry. And, no. and we can also Good. assume if they were worth much, you wouldn't be replacing them. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> no. Okay. Appreciate it. Good conversation. Any uh, further discussion? If not, I need a motion. Motion to award the purchase of three Ford Super Duty trucks in the total amount of $164,432 from Krause Ford of Tawnytown. Second. I got a motion. I got a second. Any discussion? Seen here none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank you. much. Have a great day. You too. You too. Okay, let's talk about Pinch Valley Road. Request a public hearing. Wait, are we on that or not yet? Yeah, we are. Yes, um, I think we have someone who would like to make public comment. I'm sorry? I'll wait till public the comment. comment. Uh, no, we bear, bear with me. Initially, we do it before. So. Okay, bear, bear with me one second. I just want to get myself set. We are on to okay, okay, Pinch yeah. Valley Road. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Yeah, it's the yes. last page in yep. the... Uh, so let's go with public comment first, and then we'll go on to the discussion. Um, so You want to pull that down? Sorry. We have public comment? Open. Yes, Pinch? sorry. Yep. Um, Good morning, gentlemen. Um, morning. Interesting, I'm on this side of the fence. <laughs> um, I am a soon-to-be resident of a home off of Pinch Valley Road. Um, so this, of course, has just come to um, my husband and I's attention that this is potentially going to be happening. Um, I did notice on the agenda it says that there is going to be requests for um, a public hearing and that is kind of what I am asking for is if something can be held like a town hall at either Pleasant Valley Fire Hall um, with a full explanation to the residents of Pinch Valley Road and adjacent roads off of Pinch Valley Road uh, such as Pleasant Valley and Hugh Shop Road as to what exactly this details. Um, I can tell you, as a soon-to-be resident of a home there, um, Pinch Valley Road is used by 
potent mostly all the residential people. Um, not too many people use it as a cutoff, you know, a way to get around major highways. It, it is locally mostly used. Um, so I just, you know, hopefully you can take some a little bit more time on this. You know, if, if it is a matter of having to do the airport expansion before, you know, I just, if you have to do the airport expansion and then look at what you need to do with Pinch Valley, but I, I just want to make sure that the county continues to make wise choices and not later on going, oh, we, maybe we shouldn't have done that. So that's what I'm asking. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's get into uh, the discussion, uh, the briefing. Sure. <clears throat> Good morning, Commissioners, and thank you for your time this morning. Morning. Uh, Director Boki and I are here this morning to request a public hearing regarding the official closure of Pinch Valley Road. Uh, give me one second. I'll pull that back up. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So as you can see from the... Well, let me, let me continue on. I'm sorry. Um, as you know, the county has been, been pursuing the acquisition of fee simple property and various easements necessary for the future runway safety enhancement project. The first phase of construction and relocation of Meadow Branch Road outside of the runway free object area is scheduled to begin in March of this year. As part of the planning and design of the runway and safety enhancements, a portion of Pinch Valley Road is planned to be closed across the airport property and cul de sacs installed at each end as shown in the exhibit. The official process to close a portion of the county road involves advertising notice of public hearing for 30 days and a public hearing must be held to consider objections and counter positions. Um, and so as you can see here, uh, the road crosses mostly airport property. This cul-de-sac to the uh, east is on airport property. The cul-de-sac to the west is on private property. Uh, the property owner there owns all of the property that you see from our, from our property line to that cul-de-sac. Um, they are in favor of putting that cul-de-sac there, uh, and uh, we are working with them to purchase the easement to construct that cul-de-sac on their property. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes, um, I'm curious, and I know uh, everything's subject to change. What's the potential time frame? Uh, if 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 you start out you have the public hearing and and i don't know if it's already designed we when will the road close potentially the road, the road itself potentially will close i would say th within three to five years um it's going to be one of the one of the first things that we do uh well for one of the first things we're going to do is clear uh, we need to, we need to do a lot of clearing um but that roadway where, where you see um, you can see the end of the runway there uh it from the from the end of that runway it goes down into a valley and then back up the other side. That road will be under 40 foot of soil when we when we um, extend the soil that we need for for the uh, runway extension. And, and that was going to be my next question. This this isn't for safety, whatever. This is because it's an actual part of the construction and it's it, going to be graded over. It's it's going to be graded over, but yes, it's also safety. That area is in the runway protection zone, um, and we need to own and control everything within our runway protection zone. As you know, I've told you before, the runway protection zone is notoriously where, if a, if a plane is taking off or landing, it's notoriously where they would uh, ha have trouble and or crash. And, and for everything you've just said is reason why there, there's no option to really relocate, it has to be closed. That, that's correct. As far as the way it's been planned, yes, yes, sir. With the uh, timeline in development, and changes that you know are to be made regarding the uh, the runway. Um, you said three to five years. Could that be pushed to the right as far as the the timeline? I mean, is there a a like something has to happen for this to then be closed? I mean, or could it be one of the latter activities? It, it would need so i mean it, it it can certainly push if if some of the you know the design we haven't designed the actual runway and or this area yet 100 percent right. um you know we've, we've done planning phases but uh you yeah, know once 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 the design is done this this will be like i said you know we're doing clearing and this will right. be one of the one of the first activities um right. 
as we as we prepare to install the new runway. Uh, grading grading absolutely will be one of the first activities. And because of the grading you described, it's it's you know we're looking at a flat picture, but there's no way that that the runway and the taxiway could be ever installed without the road closed because of the amount of grade it needed to make it make if we saw a profile it might you know hit gotcha. us in the head more but it, it just it has to be early yes it, I'll uh, you in the head. <laughs> <laughs> like i said oh, it's, no, I it's it's anywhere it's, it's about 40 50 feet under uh soil that, that that road will be under i mean like so it goes down the valley goes down about 40 feet and yes it'll be 40 foot of fill over top of that road so can I ask, and I'm, I'm, again, we only have part of the map here. Um, within that section of road that would potentially be closed, uh, it looks like there's a smaller road that kind of like S's off of it. Yes. Now, it, what is that road? So that road is on airport property. It is, it, it is a, um, it's a dirt road that is used to access to the, the farm field that is on the airport property that we, we leased to a farmer. Um, that road... That dirt road extends from from Pinch Valley uh, all the way over to Indian Head Valley. And I'm, I'm imagining that road is not a public road or will not be open to the public. It, it's on private property. Yes, okay. that's correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I can. I just a quick comment. I, I I mean I can understand. I can understand how there might be some residents affected by this because it it cuts off sort of a north northeast route for them and I'm not surprised there's there's going to be public comment about this I think when we spoke about it a couple about a month ago we really hadn't heard much about the road closure but I, I knew there'd be I knew there'd be some opposition to it there's got to be I mean you're closing a road so I mean it looks like we might have three to five years to go plenty of time to let everybody know what's going on but at the same time I don't know. Maybe look at some mitigating. If we if we if we go this route, maybe some mitigating changes to existing roads where it's not as I don't know. Is there anything we can do to the existing roads to to just I don't know, smooth things out and increase the, the the ability to get up to um, that northeast area? Like I think it's Pleasant Valley is up there a little easier than the way it is now. If we do do close the road. Indian, I think Indian Head Valley is the, is the closest road, um, and so what I would say there, that I, we can certainly look at that. That may require more property acquisition to to um, take the to ex extend that road uh, across couple, the, across that way. Returns to get out of uh, as this area as it stands now. We we own that property, but. Again, that property is in the runway protection zone, so we can't we can't install a road across the one runway protection zone. Um, but I can certainly look to see if there's any kind of alternate. I guess I'm not I'm not asking the question real well, but I think you understand my question. Yes, I do. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll certainly dig into it. One, two, three, four, five, real nine, like literal ninety degree turns. Uh, if there was a way to, I don't know, increase the flow, I guess. It's interesting. Is across the county, we either have cul-de-sacs that want to stay as cul-de-sacs <laughs> or we have roads that you know want to stay as roads and not turn into cul-de-sacs um and uh it does it becomes inconvenient for those that are uh on those roads and for future homeowners you know um the impacts are significant um you know and uh it is their priority you know, is getting in and out of their home, their driveway, their 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 road, their neighborhood, and uh, yeah, that this is this is significant um, to those that are living on that road, and we gotta, you know, again have that empathetic approach and look at other opportunities, but you know we'll see where it goes. I think right at this point though is. Um, giving us the details, getting some comments, and then opening up for, because uh, that's what you want to do, is schedule a public hearing, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and I think it's great, um, the public commenter don't throw stuff, but people are getting a lot of notice 
about what's happening with this. And I understand the concern with any road closed, but if you look historically at the airport, I remember when people thought it was the end of the world, Meadow Branch was going to close. And now to everybody, it's the existing road, you know. So, um, so giving you notice and uh, you so can to plan. Your, to your point, <laughs> Commissioner, it's been, it's been in the master plan for 15 years. Um, uh, and so... Yes, that notice has been out there. Um, we, we, are, we have reached the, the point where we need to, the FAA needs to know that we're serious about closing this road, so that's why right. we're in front of you today to get the official closure to right. move forward with that. Understood. Well, but the, the recommendation is not to close the road, it's to schedule the public hearing, correct? correct. Yeah. Right. Yep. Okay, do I have a motion? I'll move the Board of Commissioners direct the DPW schedule a public hearing to officially close a portion of Pinch Valley Road. Second. I got a motion. I got a second. Any discussion further on this? Seeing here none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let's talk about the relocation <clears throat> Metal Branch Road. All right. So as I stated in the previous agenda item, the first phase of construction for the airport runway safety enhancement project is the relocation of Meadow Branch Road outside of the, the future runway object free area. And it has been awarded to Allen Myers and is scheduled to begin construction in March of this year. Uh, the Department of Public Works is requesting approval from the Board of County, County Commissioners of Delta Airport Consultants Task Order Number 5 regarding construction and administration expenses for the relocation of Meadow Branch Road uh, construction administration will entail construction compliance monitoring, uh, submittal and shop drawing review and approval, uh, geotechnical and materials testing and inspections, punch list inspection, final inspection, record record drawings uh, and updates to the airport layout plan. Uh, the task order total is 455,000. Uh, the scope of work and costs have been have gone through an independent fee estimate review. Uh, which is required by the FAA. Uh, so, that, so what that is is they, they actually take a look at the um, scope of work that Delta has proposed to us. Uh, and we, so an independent consultant that does the same work looks at that and uh, determines whether they, they feel that fee is uh, reasonable. And so that's, that is, an F, like I said, that's an FAA requirement. And so uh, it, it's gone through that and it has been approved by the FAA who will pay 90% of the task order number five costs. Uh, so that's 409,500 and the county will pay 10% of the task order number five costs or 45,500 uh, out of the airport enterprise fund. These costs have been budgeted and no further funding is needed at this time. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, in, in the beginning and I probably wasn't paying attention. Did you say this work, the physical work's been bid and Alan Myers is doing it? That's correct. And and then Delta, um, does the does the county control their subcontractors? Do do they I I doubt if they self perform all this. Maybe they do. They do not. No. Okay. So do do they look at local people or there's no requirement for that? And do you approve subs or only after a certain amount how's that work on this we do work with with delta um there are local subs uh, so so the surveying is being done by clsi um not all of the subs are local so the, the there's there's compliance monitoring which the, the compliance monitor will be looking at uh, are we are we meeting the davis bacon act uh, are we paying the correct wages uh, are are we um meeting our dbe goal on the project so there's a lot there's a lot that goes into this and that's i mean on most of our construction projects, you'll see that our, our fees aren't this high, uh, but in this particular case, there are, there's a lot of reporting and a lot of requirements that the F, that, that is required by the FAA. Um, so that's why you'll, I mean, this is this is slightly higher than what we would, we would uh, typically pay on a construction project ourselves. And the good news is somebody's <clears throat> helping pay the bill. Yeah. That's, right. that's right. I mean, you're, you're speaking like a true program manager. <laughs> so uh, no, I mean, really. Uh, and I appreciate that because they're very insightful questions that uh, I think need to be asked and need to be listened to because uh, <clears throat> it is. Every time we turn around, it's $455,000 here and 600 I mean, it's like it's a lot of money. And, you know, the more we keep it local, the better I know I feel. And I think my, you know, 
colleagues feel and we should all feel but uh anyway um i'll move the board of commissioners approve delta task order number five for the construction administration for the re relocation of meadow branch road outside the runway object free area in the amount of four hundred fifty five thousand dollars second i got a motion i got a second is there any further discussion on this? Just a yeah, really quick question, and I, I may have missed this. I apologize if I did. Uh, why is it called Delta Task? Or I mean, Delta, what is? Oh, the company. Delta's the consultant. They're, okay. they're, they're Delta's the airport consultant right. um, yep. that we've okay. hired for the project. Yeah. yeah. Thank you much. Thank you. Yep. Absolutely. And you'll get to know Delta real well. The consultants are very, very good what they do. Um, okay, I got a motion, guys. Second. Any further discussion on this? Seen here, none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, an item number nine, um, <clears throat> and it's a discussion of the supermajority resolution. Um, did a request by Commissioner Ford? Yes. Yeah. So and so I didn't realize the um, okay. actual resolution wasn't in the book, so. Is this the resolution itself? The, this is the, old, the existing the resolution. resolution. We'll the existing work, resolution. We'll, we'll work through it. What's that? It's the existing resolution. Yeah. Okay. Um, Go ahead, Tom. What's that? So, okay, so where are we going with this? Uh, do, you, do you want to take the lead on this? Sure, or? I can take the lead on this. So what we're looking at is resolution 81 or excuse me 815-2011 <coughs> which uh, the at the time the board of county commissioners opted to uh, essentially create a supermajority resolution that would require any additional future uh, tax considerations to be passed via a supermajority instead of a uh, three three person majority for the board um, what we're looking at in reference to this today is uh, one issue that had sort of come up in, in topic of this is this has been an issue that at times gets brought up is that we have a supermajority. Well, in theory, the supermajority could be removed by three commissioners out of the five. Um, so what we're looking at today would be the option to uh, require a supermajority to remove the supermajority, hence strengthening our position on this obviously if there were ever a requirement then we just all decided to raise taxes it would still be the requirement of the initial supermajority to do so it just would not allow this board or any current or future boards to uh, easily remove this resolution with a 3-2 uh, uh, vote so Commissioner basically what you're talking about is a safeguard for a safeguard that is correct <clears throat> Well, it makes sense to me I guess I guess my question is we don't have a have to have a supermajority to approve the supermajority for the supermajority do we I hope not I, <laughs> and, and that can I actually talked about that I, I, it's sort of like that mirror effect it's not the, you know, the dumbest question I've ever no, no, asked no, but no, it's no. probably close no but I, I no. agree it's, it's like, like that infinite mirror effect yes where does it right stop? oh yeah I'm in that I'm in that mirror <laughs> effect. no I, I I agree it's repetitive oh. I'll, I'll just say that we have state laws they can repeal they can be repealed by the, the state legislature in in uh, home rule counties you have charters that ta there's a specific procedure for repealing that we have as county commissioners uh, ordinances and resolutions and typically mm -hmm. it's three out of five can can repeal it so so no I'm, I'm sorry well what commissioner my, yeah my question was and and I this was done in February of 2011. Is there any history on this, on uh, on if that was discussed when this was done, or j just not not talked about? And then, if if the commissioners would pass this, then we're we're passing it in in theory, and you would need to write something. Somebody would need to write something. I would think technically it, legally that we would then approve right what I would suggest is if the board's interested in adding the supermajority to the supermajority then then we give that direction and then we'll bring back 
the, so this would be the first the, step. I would that. I think would be best therefore you have it in writing you know exactly what you're approving that was my concern yeah. because again um, I think I like the idea but I before I say yes to it I'd like to see how it's gonna look not that I don't trust everybody but. yeah certainly and as I really recollect and, and Ted Deb and and Tim can all chime in as well on um, the 59th board um, during their first budget deliberations um, um, instituted this policy yeah, and Deb, and you put it into up resolution anyway, you can be on the next and um i'm sorry to be topic. putting you on the so, spot that's um, right. and it was <clears throat> I, I don't recall there being a lot of discussion or you know it, it was their feeling that this was important this is the way I, well, I, I i do think it's important and, and what i'd like to see coming back if we get it is a is essentially a a new resolution and you're just going to be adding language, I imagine, yeah. under whereas uh, that it takes a supermajority to to change this resolution, and uh, I'd be happy to sign it. It did come up uh, in a subsequent board. Uh, Commissioner Fraser, I think, introduced a a, a, re a repeal option for repealing the original supermajority uh, resolution, and it was not even acted on. Nobody nobody Second. was interested in that. So. That's a brief history. Yeah. So do we want to do, do we proceed by general consent that we want to see this? Do we have to vote on this? What's I the think just general uh, does is the we board a super super majority. <laughs> that means Stella's voting. So well, we're that's good. what I was going to say. Let's ask Stella and maybe uh, <laughs> she'll give us the guidance. But OK, so it, it could be real creative and say this can only be changed with a vote of six of the five of us. Uh, <laughs> six of them. OK, so so it sounds like uh, we're moving forward with um, you know, presenting us verbiage where it would take a supermajority to change, you know, modify or change the existing resolution. Yes, next Thursday we'll have one okay. uh, in front of you to vote Sounds to, good. To okay. vote on. Good. This is for the next. Okay. Time. Thank you. So, um, FY 24 preliminary recommended CIP and bond authorization. Thank you very much. This is the first of many spiral notebooks we will be getting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did everybody get a copy of this? Yes. Do you know where I look for One it? One for Tim. Tim, where I look for it. Thanks. Should be on That's your job, Commissioner. You have to pass you, it on to Tim. Yeah, it should be on there. <laughs> you see it? You just have to remember when to throw out these books and when to get the approved books type of thing because they will add up. Thank you very in much. Your office. You're not going to ask questions about this, are you? There's a test at the end. Yeah. Is it? Uh, is it? Cumulative or is it unit specific? <laughs> it's choice. open book. Does that help? Oh, it's oh, open book. Oh, she's got more. There's always Thank more. You. Oh, we we have them. We have this. Is this the same Don't, thing? Is it? I think so. I want that. Is it? I got this. Better safe. Yeah. And it's it's this one is for those hard to hard of reading. Yeah, like me. This is for me. Exactly. Do you want to give one to Stella? No. Just, you know. I don't think she's interested. Who's left out? <laughs> Sir. You lost the commissioner. You did. Yes. Let's give it a, a few uh, seconds and. You know, I have to say more than once this morning, at, you know, going through this meeting, I keep thinking, like, who's this standing over here? Because I see the T-shirt and I'm like, oh, somebody wants to talk about something. And then I'm like, oh, it's the giraffe. <laughs> I saw the giraffe and I said, as if I don't have enough people weighing in on this, now I've got a giraffe exactly. looking at my <laughs> shoulder. How, how long is it here? Two weeks. So she'll be so, circulating around various departments. I've heard rumors she may be driving a snow plow if we get snow. Well, I don't know. I think our so. next meeting, it should be on her side. <laughs> you think we could fit it in Tim's office? <laughs> Good question. It barely fit in the elevator. That's what I know. I bet. She's a little tall. I wonder who put this on, the, the glasses, reading glasses. I like on. the reading glasses. Yeah. Did, did she come with the reading glasses? Uh, yes. Yeah, or is that a new edition? She showed up with the reading glasses yesterday. <clears throat> She's very intelligent. 
Okay, so uh, item number 10, FY24 preliminary recommended CIP and bond authorization. So this is the first public step in the next budget process. Uh, we're actually here to do two things today. One is to share with you the preliminary recommended CIP. This iteration exists to give to the Planning Commission so they have something to react to, uh, to give their approval that this is consistent with the county's master plan. Uh, before we go to them, we share it with you so that you see what's going to be going, going there. I'll talk a little bit more about, well, I'll talk a lot more about that in just a second. Second thing we're going to do is talk about bond authorization. Uh, every year we have to go to the General Assembly to get authority to issue debt. Um, that legislation is the same legislation every year, except there's a blank we have to fill in. How much are we asking for? Uh, the second thing we'll be doing today is getting your approval to send that number down to the, the General Assembly. So you have a few things in your hands up there. One is this orange book. This is what was requested in the CIP process. Uh, people often ask me, so how much did people request? And I never know the answer because my starting point is never what did people ask for. My starting point is what do we already have planned? How much money do we think we have? And how do we build to work within that, that number? But you can see what people asked for. Uh, much of this is not going to be in the recommendations. And it's also important to note that there are other things people might be interested in that don't even show up here. Sometimes people will make a call themselves that that'd be good to do, but I'm not sure it's the most important thing, or they might say, I don't see a chance of this moving through, and they don't even ask for it. So. This, this is what officially went through the process. And then the yellow book is the preliminary recommended CIP. So first, what is the pre preliminary recommended CIP? It's a first look. It's fiscally feasible, although with where we are right now, we have to be I have to say a little bit more about fiscally feasible. Uh, we, we believe this is doable this year, but you remember our operating plan is currently not in balance. So when we say anything is fiscally feasible, uh, once we look beyond today, we're saying we still have things to work out. Uh, consistent with commissioner goals, this is another tough one right now. We know very little about what this board's goals are for the CIP. So this is more about consistent with the decisions that were made for the plan that is currently in, in place. Uh, as we move through the process, uh, it could be that this board will take some paths that we have not built into this plan yet, but that, that will um, build as we go. A continuation of existing plans, this is always true. Uh, you building your six-year operating plan or six-year capital plan is not a commitment to anything. It's a statement of intent. It's a roadmap for where we think we're going. But not only can it change, we know it will change. There will always be a, a change as we have another year's worth of information, another year's worth of discussion by the board, and other things coming up that we had not planned for. And, uh, and for you, maybe the most important point here is this is the starting point for your discussions. Kind of flip side, what the preliminary recommended CIP is not. It is not the final CIP. So anybody out there who looks at this and says, oh, I'm not in here, story's not over. On the other side, what you want is in here, the story's not over either. It is not the end of analysis. The budget analysts continue to work with the agencies, not on every one of these. Some of these we've gotten to the point where we believe need to, but there are some things where work continues, and that will be true as we move through the process. 
and it is not a commitment to project funding, timing, or revenue mix. Now, eventually, we will be, will be making commitments for fiscal year 24, but again, the rest of it remains a plan. Three big ideas as you think about this. The CIP is largely dedicated to maintaining the infrastructure we already have. There are a lot, uh, not a lot of new initiatives. And even some of the big projects that we have right now, and there are not a lar large number, but there are more big projects than there have been for more than a decade. Uh, but East Middle School and Career and Tech are largely about maintaining infrastructure. Career and Tech, we are adding some space, but a lot of it is about mm -hmm. taking care of what was already there. Uh, the two big projects we have that are really new initiatives would be the sheriff's headquarters and the state's attorney's headquarters. And when I say new, uh, they're not new starting this moment, but they are construction projects ahead of us. I think as you consider your capital budget, you'd be very careful about adding projects that are going to bring ongoing costs with them. Again, we're currently overcommitted on the operating side, so every new operating cost just makes our problems that much bigger. And when we talk about operating costs, there's a lot of things to think about. Uh, if we issue debt, we have debt service, that's gonna add a cost to our, to our budget. But it's also things like, does this project increase the need for people? Or are we gonna have electric bills? Are we gonna have uh, oil bills, are we going to have grass to mow? We have new things to maintain. And this is a further down the road kind of thing, but something that's growing in importance in my mind. We need to remember everything we build, a new park, a new road, a new building, someday is going to need to be renewed. And we, we should not ignore that as we're making the decisions on do we want to do something new today. If we find ourselves in a situation where we want to decrease our spending for capital purposes, there's not a lot of flexibility here. Most of what we're doing is stuff that just has to get done. Uh, probably the two big exceptions would be the state's attorney headquarters and the sheriff headquarters. Now, I'm not suggesting you could easily back away from those, just saying if you found yourself in a situation where you said, we have to find a way to spend less money to free up dollars for something else, those would be decisions you can make. An example, um, the um, sheriff's headquarters down in Eldersburg, when we took that away, we, we had it pushed out, but then we basically- the precinct. The precinct, yeah. That so, freed up I'm sorry. dollars, right? I mean, that was, uh, you know, at first it was on a certain day, then we pushed it out further, but now it's not even in. I don't believe the CIP. That's right. Right? Yes. So that, that's an example of what you're saying. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Rothstein, that, that sort of answered part of my question. What happens to that project if we cancel it? But the, the money itself, we are not obligated in any other way to, to spend that money. That, that money can come back, mm -hmm. comes off the CIP budget. There isn't because of its because of its a bond issuance other things. There's nothing tying our hands. Uh, that money comes back to us. Is that is that right? Are you gonna say something? Um, well, you answer first, and then I'll see if you answer correctly. Then she'll, she'll give <laughs> give you the right answer. <laughs> no. Um, so conceptually, yes, uh, the board decides to put these things in. The board can decide to take them out. Occasionally, there are things where we are tied to some law, some state or federal mandate that might complicate that. Uh, but taking it out can mean different things. If we planned to sell debt for it, uh, we this will come up in other discussions, but we, we try to time the issuance of debt so that we're, we don't issue it before we need to spend the money. Most of it actually follows the spending. So, if we haven't issued the debt yet, all that happens is a planned issue debt goes away. Right. So it doesn't create any money, but it makes a planned expenditure go, go away. If we have sold debt, uh, 
Now we do have some money in hand that is freed up for another purpose, although that can get complicated too, but we don't need to get into that today. If we have cash on it, you can take cash and put it wherever you want. Uh, again, few exceptions. You know, if it's a rec and parks project where we have program open space, that's a state dedicated revenue. Uh, you can stop the project, but you can't go pave a road with that, with that money. So the easy answer to your question is yes, but when we get into actual things happening, there might be all kinds of details we have to talk about. And we did not um, obligate dollars to that precinct at that point, did we? I we, mean, had, we, we had, it was planned in the budget, plan, but was there was planned, nothing tied. But no, it wasn't obligated, and then we, bonds or anything. no, and then we pushed it out further, and um, you know, it's it's risk mitigation. It's it's working with uh, the community and the sheriff and figuring out what made sense. But we took it off to allow us to look at other opportunities for other projects. So, so did that get you where you needed to go? It did. I you know I, I appreciate that. Uh, um, uh, the hypothetical case being, you know, we don't know what the future holds and we need we need money. So I say, hey, what? Let's you know, let's take the money from this project that's planned in the future and because we need it to use it for something else but I understand your point of being it's not quite that simple but and you, it works you'll find that this will, will happen a lot you're gonna ask me what you think is a simple question that gets a simple answer and I often will say well it's not quite as simple as that and depending on the situation we'll figure out how far we have to go explaining the complications I, I, pr I appreciate that very much Thank you. okay capital fund and I say this this way because we talk about the capital budget but it can get mixed up exactly what that means so remember government governments run on fund accounting so your operating budget is actually the general fund we have a capital fund but projects that are associated with your enterprise funds solid waste airport uh, water and sewer are separate funds of them uh, of their own so their capital projects are in their funds, mm -hmm. not in the capital fund, but they all show up in the capital budget. Right. Are you having fun yet? <laughs> Just want to give you a, a little history, some context for where we are relative to where we've been. The red bars are history, the blue bars are the CIP that we're talking about now. And you could see what capital fund spending was over these years. Uh, you'll notice there was a significant dip that was <laughs> reacting to the Great Recession. Uh, but like many other things, we've, we've never gone back to the same levels of activity on the capital side that we used to. And, and this is literally true. If you go to a capital budget book from 15 years ago and you look at it compared to this, the size difference is, is easily noticeable. Uh, this doesn't fully tell the story though, so I want to show you the same information now adjusted for inflation. And what you see is our spending is considerably lower than it was in a practical way than it was one at another time. And even this isn't the whole story, because all we're doing here is using um, the consumer price index, which isn't really a very good measure of the costs that we're facing on construction projects. Mm -hmm. So I would say it would look even more interesting if we actually built in cost of steel and cost of asphalt and, and things like that. So um, not going anywhere with this, just want you to have some understanding that we truly are doing less now than we did historically. Some more history and in a minute, I'm going to be showing you what the projections for our outstanding debt will be based on this plan. But I wanted you to have some history to understand. We're going to be telling you that outstanding debt is going to be growing. But I want you to know that it's growing after years of actually having decreased significantly. You'll see in fiscal year 11, we had about $330 million of outstanding debt. That dropped to about $240 million in FY22. So over 11 years, we actually cut our debt by about a, a third. Um, now, nobody, I don't, I don't think, ever thought we could continue doing that forever. I mean, the, the needs don't go away. 
uh, and we are going to see that this this path will change now. Now, as we look ahead, based on this CIP, you'll see that uh, outstanding debt is going to, to start to grow. But even at this, at fiscal year 29, um, 18 years after that fiscal year 11 number I showed you, we will have gone from about 330 to $410 million. And of course, this is not a straight line into the future. This is based on the specific projects that we're talking about here. Uh, as we consider what other things are or are not in our future, then this will change. So what's in the preliminary recommended CIP? We're not going to go through all the projects. There are just certain ones I want to touch on because they are big, they're important, they're noteworthy for some reason. Now, I mentioned this before, but important again, you know, this idea that most of what we're doing is about maintaining the things that we already own. Uh, it's also about maintaining our efforts in agricultural land preservation and in water quality. And remember, with water quality, uh, much of what we're doing is based on the Clean Water Federal Clean Water Act, and as it is implemented by the Maryland Department of Environment. Uh, so you have other people telling you what you need to be doing here, not specifically project by project, but the the end results that we need to be working toward. Uh, we have to make some changes to our emergency communications system. Uh, in a simple way, this is about taking some old technology and updating it. Uh, it's not really a discretionary item. It's something we, we have to do. Uh, the Career and Tech Center for the school system, well on its way. Uh, renovating the existing building and adding a, a significant piece of new space. East Middle School, school replacement, also well under its way. A long list of park projects. Uh, in most years, we, where you see the most activity is with park projects, and that is because so much of it is funded by program open space, a state-shared tax. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, that's dedicated to this purpose. It doesn't buy you anything else. Uh, but it does allow us to keep going with park projects. Do you use other funds besides Project Open Space to fund park projects? Yes. Um, but in, in this, some <laughs> money goes from the county to towns or the cities for construction also. Is that part of this or is that a whole separate thing? Well, there's not really money going to the towns for projects. We have a place that where we cooperate on uh, water quality projects. Uh, when we're doing, the eight towns in the county used to each have their own permits. MP, uh, National Pollution Elimination. NPDS, National Pollution Elimination charge Systems. Leave it, leave, leave it at that. <laughs> um, so we, we each had permits uh, a few years ago. We all went together on one permit, and part of what we agreed to do with the towns there is when we took on projects that existed inside the towns, uh, the towns would be funding 20% of the cost of those projects, and the county would be putting in 80%. That's in our budget, though. That doesn't show up in, in their budgets. Now, some, some project open space money yeah. can go to them. Is that uh, okay. through you and Parks and yeah. Rec, or is that? Yeah, so that's basically a pass-through. Okay. It, it's not so much us deciding to give people money as it comes from the state, and then we give it to them. Okay. Um, so when I talk about maintaining infrastructure, what am I talking about? You know, roads and bridges, HVACs, roofs, paving, a lot of asphalt. You know, when you think about the buildings we have and you think about the school system, uh, and with the schools, it's not just parking lots, but you know, bus loops and roads in and out of school, school sites. Our parks, you know, we need, um, we build parks and then you have to maintain them. Technology goes on forever. Uh, stormwater ponds, water and sewer, all these things need ongoing renewal. You know, and, and back on that idea I talked about a little bit earlier about thinking about the future when we are deciding to take on new things. Uh, there, are, there are always good, good reasons for doing something 
new. Uh, we've gotten to a point now, though, where I think we have to be asking ourselves with every new thing, do we really want to take on something more to maintain and renew in the future? <clears throat> Schools. You know, we already mentioned Career and Tech in East Middle School. We have HVAC projects, uh, roof replacement projects. You know, an interesting thing with, with the schools, and Commissioner Kyler will have some familiarity with this probably, but we went through a pretty big bubble of school roofs that needed to be replaced. And much of that is attributable to a time when we were building a lot of schools. There wasn't always as much money as people might have wanted, and a choice that got made frequently was to do lower quality roofs that had lower lives. Uh, lo uh, um, Life shorter lifespan yeah. uh, and we suddenly found ourselves with a whole lineup of, of roofs that need to be replaced uh, the good news here is as of fiscal year 30 we will have made our way through that bubble and and the roofs that we're that are being replaced are being replaced with longer life roofs we have we have uh, some of our schools now we have expectation of 40 50 years on, on some of the roofs and I think people, uh, it's hard to understand. You have them together, but the HVAC and the roof replacements are very much tied together in, in how and Often, when they can yeah. happen. Yeah, when we have both of those happening, uh, we, we time the, the budget and the construction to do the HVAC before you do the roof so you're not messing up what you, you just did. You know, I talked about paving, technology, a school system just like us, you know, heavily dependent on technology. Relatively short life for a lot of things, and we have to, to keep replacing. Uh, we'll be running into this a little bit later, but talking about the HVAC, uh, a big change you'll notice between this year's CIP and next year's CIP is how much money is in there for HVACs at the schools. That's because we, we had nothing in this year's budget. There were concerns about state funding that uh, Career and Tech and East Middle School had sucked up all the funding and was there going to be anything available for HVAC projects. Uh, we looks like we're moving past that. The state has stepped up a little bit more than maybe we could have counted on. So you'll see that that plan is, is back in place again. Maintaining effort, agricultural land preservation, uh, budget continues throughout, and water quality, we've already talked a bit about that. Some new things in 24 through 29. Uh, an antenna system at the community college. Basically this is, as we move to 5G, some of the technology that was good enough before is no longer good enough to do what it was supposed to do, and we need to replace that. Uh, community college technology in 28 and 29. We have a pretty long-standing arrangement with the college where the commissioners have agreed to provide a certain amount of funding for their technology needs to be matched by fundraising for them. This is the one place where we've tried to do fundraising in connection with our capital budget that actually worked, and, and it has worked well. So they're reaching the end of the last agreement that was in place and looking to start another. Uh, we've added self-contained breathing apparatus. Uh, we've been tackling this as kind of a, as needs came up in the past, uh, volunteer companies coming in. Um, we're, we're now, we think we've gotten to a point where we may as well just build it into the plan because in practice, that's what's happening. And a, uh, a I don't know if remodeled is the right word, a, a, a new better holding area for the historic Mm -hmm. uh, courthouse. Cleese Mill Road slope repair. Uh, when we get further along, we'll probably show you some pictures of, of this. But this this is one of those things that we it was not planned for because it was okay until it wasn't okay. Now we have some work we need to do on um, a a slope that sits above Cleese Mill Road. McKinstry's Mill Road. This is a bridge over a tributary to Little Pipe Creek. Not all water in Carroll County actually has a name. So this one just gets called tributary to Little Pipe Creek. Um, we always have bridge projects. 
that's fairly stable in the planning, but sometimes we find that a bridge, as it gets inspected, needs to move ahead of others because it's become a, a, a greater concern. And you'll hear more about this again later. But uh, for most of our bridges, 80% of the funding comes from the, from the federal government. So part of what we have to do here is also match what we're trying to do with bridges to the actual flow of revenue from the federal government. Uh, there are some outdoor basketball courts, and then STEM Run, this is also a bridge, over Wolf Pit Branch. When this came up, I had never heard of Wolf Pit Branch before, and made me wonder a little bit <laughs> where that name came from. <laughs> some changes from the plan that exists right now. Um, in roads, we have two projects to do new construction, Georgetown Boulevard extension and Monroe Avenue extension. With both of those, uh, we're seeing changes in, in construction costs that are leading us to revise the numbers that are in the budget. And with the pavement management, this is taking care of the roads we already have. Uh, same story, prices are, are going up. And you see right below that scope, this is really about timing. Uh, there were some roads that we intended to do this year that we couldn't do within the money that was available and did some rearranging over the five years to keep those next in line, but then had to rethink some of the other roads. Ted, Georgetown Boulevard is, I think, down in Eldersburg, but where's Monroe? Also Eldersburg. Well, actually, they're both Eldersburg. One, they're both Eldersburg? George, yeah, Georgetown is that hairpin turn mm -hmm. by uh, Oscars. Mm -hmm. and. Um, creating a circle there because the intent is to then uh, take one road off of that circle, go into the Beatty property, uh, all the way like towards Progress. Monroe is uh, split by 26, right? Actually, it comes no. north of 26. It's split it, by the yeah. Wolf property. It's, it's split by Wolf property. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's, it's split by Wolf property. Right, so this is filling in, yeah. filling in a gap yeah. in an existing road. Right. And I, I just uh, Georgetown, that, that hairpin turn is so freaking dangerous uh, the way it is now because it's like a 10 mile per hour and there's more accidents that happen on that hairpin. But creating that circle, you know, it's going to be important. So. You need to slow down. You need to slow down, Commissioner. <laughs> it ain't me. It's my son. No, it's, I mean, it's a ton of folks. Uh, I just went there this weekend. Last week. huh? There was, was an accident last week. Oh, yeah. It, it's crazy. Um, but people do need to slow down. They do. <laughs> Most importantly, everywhere. And there's a park project, Northwest Trail. We had to revise the cost estimates. Park restoration is a capital budget that is used to renew, like pavilions, for example, at the, um, at the parks. Also cost increases. Um, systemic building renovations. This is for the county. Again, talking about HVAC and, and roofs for our buildings. Uh, generator replacements, parking lot overlays. Now, uh, you know, with costs for capital projects, yeah, you know, because we're planning for six years, we knew we do need to build in certain assumptions for costs in, in the future. I just want to make sure you understand that gets reevaluated every year. We don't we don't build it in and then say that's what it is. You know, if we find that asphalt drops by twenty percent, we will react to that. Or if steel goes up by 10%, we will react to that. So obviously much more in here than what I just said, but I think those are, those are some of the highlights. So what's not in the preliminary, preliminary recommended CIP? A much, much longer list than what's actually in. And again, I'm not going to try and tell you everything, although it is all in the orange book. Uh, schools. William Winchester Elementary School modernization is next up on their priorities. You know, and talking about modernizations, um, we haven't done very, very many for a long time. Uh, East Middle School is getting it, Career and Tech is getting it. Uh, back before that, um, Mount Airy Middle School, has there been something since then? I, um, it's been, been a while since we've taken on one. Now, if you think about a school, we have 40 of them. And let's say we think a school has a life of 40 years. 
If that's the case, you need to be doing a school a year, either a modernization or a replacement. If you say, no, they last longer than that, they last 80 years, even there, that would mean a school every other year. Uh, we are nowhere near that kind of pace. What has been happening in practice is we're handling pieces of modernizations. We do the HVAC, we do the roof, we do an electrical system, we replace windows. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Westminster High School had bricks falling off the, f the facade. Uh, that was in nobody's plans. Uh, that, that one turned into a bit of a, how do we get this done? Mm -hmm. But you know, it's all, if you're not doing the whole thing, you, you still have to deal with, with the pieces. And I think your earlier comment about when they were building schools quickly, I've questioned William Winchester as be, we really being the next one. Liberty was probably the cheapest built high school, and I think we're soon going to start paying for the cheapness of when it got built. Yeah, and on that point, when, um, when we talk about priorities for modernizations, uh, we are largely driven by the decisions that the Board of Education makes. Um, now, in the budget office, you know, we will question some things and say, well, last year you were saying this, this year you're saying this, or isn't this a bigger con concern? But uh, we are not trying to make those decisions. Kindergarten and pre-K additions. They're going way back to when full-day kindergarten was mandated by the state. And I don't even know what this is, 15 years now? It's been a long time. There were, there were, I believe, four elementary schools that did not get additions. They didn't get them because of money and the need wasn't as compelling as some of the other places. But they never happened. Uh, we now have our next full-day kindergarten mandate, basically, with the blueprint legislation extending pre-day uh, kindergarten to a much larger population, uh, space will be needed. And this is very complicated for us right now because the legislation also makes this assumption that the private sector is going to handle about half of the need. And I've not talked to anybody in a county who believes that that's actually going to happen. So we know we're going to have to plan for pre-K capacity additions but right now, we don't, we don't really know what, what that means. We have, you know, John O'Neill yesterday talked about two things that are true but incompatible. You know, I think we're kind of there on, on this. We know the law says, counties, you need to have to handle half of this. But I think we also know it's not actually going to play out that way. So what does that mean? And what are we going to do with it? Don't have an answer for you right now. Um, but that's a fairly, that's a, that's a gap. We're going to talk some more about things that aren't in here that we need to talk about. But because it's not in here, doesn't mean we're not going to have to deal with it. It just means we don't know how to deal with it yet. Uh, Barrier-free modifications, think ADA for, for, for schools. Um, we've accomplished much of what we need to accomplish. There's not much spending going on. I believe they have somewhat of a balance, right? Oh, okay. uh, security improvements, uh, an annual request. We don't have a plan from them on what they're trying to accomplish. And we're, we're reluctant to budget money for a th theoretical uh, idea of security. Roads that are not in. Um, there's a, another place where we're looking at making a connection between some roads and also a bit of a realignment. There are some questions related to development happening there that I think need to be resolved before we can budget for this. Uh, a sidewalk down in the Eldersburg area. Uh, public Works would like to replace some existing salt barns, add some new salt barns. Uh, right now, there's no, it might be a good thing, but there's no compelling need to do it right now. Uh, Slacks Road in improvements. Uh, we have a facility going to be built on Slacks Road. Um, has some challenges. We don't know what we need to do here yet. That doesn't show up in the CIP. And that facility, that's the VA center. <clears throat> so it's a $200 million, give or take, facility that's going to be funded by the state and by the feds, not by us. A Slacks Road, if you go to Freedom Park, all the way down the end, make a left, that's Slacks Road, where the American Legion is. It's a very difficult road. Um, 
you know there's uh, <clears throat> you know on both sides of it so getting that improved for ingress egress working with the state with federal government on that road uh, and then trying to come up with a, a solution but it's got to be dealt with um, because of that project and that's a now, big if that, project if that project were private you would probably require sure. traffic study mm -hmm. and make the private entity right. at least kick in for it if not pay for it is there any hope of that with uh, with well, the people <clears throat> funding it or so hope not being that course of action but uh, actually talking to um, the state that's why I brought it up to uh, Secretary Ports um, now I don't know who the new administrator the new secretary will be but uh, he or she may be more amenable because it is on governor elect's radar about this and he is a, a ten-year veteran and I shared with him this issue last week at Mako so that may be a way to leverage it um, talking to uh, Senator Cardin the other day about it and continuing to talk to him and he said there are four people on appropriations that represent Maryland so keeping that on their radar um, is going to be important so yeah we're gonna we're gonna figure this out um, because it's gonna be a heavy lift uh, what I don't want to do is I don't want to tell anybody that the infrastructure does not allow us to have that facility there because that's a big win for the county and the community um, for job creation and taking care of our veterans so yeah. Yeah. so on funding you know there are possibilities but I'd say history doesn't lead us to count on somebody else funding this though right just, <clears throat> just one quick you, you're absolutely right if it's a private you know private um, entity we have the county has a lot of um, control over how that mm -hmm. development occurs when it's either the state or the federal government they they really basically don't tell us anything they don't have to pull any permits they don't have to do traffic studies they don't um, for example when the um, readiness center the uh, Linda general major general Linda Singh readiness center was built mm -hmm. the only thing that they uh, provided to us was um, um, you um, water and sewer utility information because right. they had to hook up to our system other than that they, we wouldn't anything so just that's yeah. the way it works yeah, yeah. <laughs> no good question though hey also not in uh, a bridge Babylon Road over Silver Run this is actually a, a bridge that has been in our plans for a number of years uh, but we need some easements from a property owner there's no no indication that we are going to be able to get them so this we we have taken this bridge out of our plan and then Woodbine Road Bridge this this is just a matter of funding and timing right? yes so I mentioned a little bit earlier we have to match up what we're going to do to the availability of federal money a bridge that we will do but it just doesn't fit in this plan yet wouldn't that be shared cost with is it how isn't that on the county line this does that particular South Branch Patapsco oh, um, we don't share costs on any bridges uh, okay. I don't know when or how this happened but every bridge that crosses a county line belongs to for maintenance purposes at least belongs to one county or the other okay good, good to know thanks yeah. and the, I, I forget I think I think I've been told and we can double check this that all the ones on the Howard County Carroll County line are ours how we got that privilege I don't know but the ones on the Frederick and Cal Carol this one I'm sure of are like from north to south they're every other so if they own one we own the next they own one so yeah it's weird. good to know yeah uh, some projects that aren't in for wreck and parks and again this is largely about available funding and what you're able to make work with Union Mills uh, it's worth stopping here to talk a little bit you know, uh, the county owns that property and the and the buildings and we've spent considerable funding on it o over years and something I was talking with the last board about you know no no board has ever sat down to to say how much are we willing to spend on the whole Union Mills property 
you know, if I told you we were going to spend $100 million, you would probably say, no, we're not. Uh, but we've never said, where, where is that line? How much are we willing to spend? And that includes, we've, we've spent things, you know, keeping the, um, the, 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 uh, the water wheel and all the pieces go with that, you know, historically accurate. And the, drawing a blank on. The miller? The, the mill, yeah. keeping the mill historically yeah. accurate. And I asked again last board, I said, you know, I know why we want it to be historically accurate. We're unusual. There aren't very many of these, these left. But again, how much money are we willing to spend to keep it historically accurate? So I uh, just want to plant that seed for you when Union Mills comes up in the future that maybe this board will want to have that conversation. And this session in future years will go faster because part of what I'm doing is what I need to give you today, but also building some context for you to be able to start talking about this since you haven't been through it already. Um, workforce development, they'd like an elevator and another accessible re restroom. Uh, they, they have what they need. This would be nicer, but doesn't have to happen. Community college, athletic complex, this is a Big, big project. College very much wants it. I understand why they want it. Uh, given the things that you have pressing on you, I, I don't see how we can even entertain taking this up. Now that said, there are other things I've said I don't see how we can entertain taking this up that boards have <laughs> taken up anyway. Uh, but there's no way that I would come to you with a recommendation that we build this into our plan. You know, this is a, a good example of folks, you know, saying, well, so-and-so has it, you know, Howard County, you know, community college has this, or this community has that with fields and other things and, and um, athletic complexes were not the same. Carroll County Community College is not the same as Howard Community College is not the same as others. They're funded differently. They're different animals. They may meet, you know, the same needs of, you know, community college, but they are, they're very different. And that's what we got to own up to is understanding those differences and why we can't, you know, do all the things they want us to do, as opposed to something like Howard Community College, because that's. The idea of a parking garage somewhere in the government complex um, comes up pretty regularly. <laughs> We almost certainly will have to do it someday, but we're not thinking that day, that day is here yet. Uh, elections. This is another one. This is, this is a hole in our plans. Um, you get the privilege of paying for the operations of the Board of Elections and for providing them space. Uh, they are being squeezed. Uh, I think they have a valid argument that they need more space, different space. Uh, we don't know where we're going with this yet, so we have no way to build this into the plan. Although it, it, has, to, it has to happen. So I, this is another one where I don't want you to think it not being in here doesn't mean that it shouldn't be in here. Uh, one thing, you know, we believe that we should explore uh, rented space for this. You know, there might be opportunities. One of their big things is they need storage space for all, all the voting equipment. That doesn't have to be fitted out office space. And there are places where sometimes you have offices in the front and storage in the back. Uh, maybe we can get there. We might have to look at building. But at the very least, I think we need to take a real hard look at different ways of approaching this. And, and they need it. But what's depressing, I had no idea how many square feet they have and need. Mm -hmm. And it, it is big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the needs, in this, the last 10, 15 years, the, the needs have grown a, a lot. Right. And you'll hear about this when we get to the operating budget, but yeah, it, it's a tough situation for you. I mean, this, the state makes decisions, you pay for them, and um, there's not a whole lot of interest in what you think about it. Yeah. Um, public Works would like a, another building to put facilities in to give uh, fleet and roads more space. Um, 
understandable thing to want, but not sure they have a compelling and urgent argument yet. Farm Museum, they're looking for a, another barn and for some restroom renovations, those aren't in here. Cabot Court Water Supply. Um, this is a little development down near Hoods Mill Landfill. We have a few people that we provide water to. Complicated situation, this isn't the time to try and get into it. Uh, just if it comes up, there's not a project in here for that. Uh, Public Works would like the maintenance center to be uh, connected to Westminster's um, sewer system. Um, the septic system is working. There's no problem to be solved here. You know, you know it might say be nicer to hooked up to a, to a system, but um, again, we don't see a, a compelling and urgent need. A transit building addition you probably have a decent argument for more space when we built this. Uh, there was some grant funding available to us. We knew what the funding was. We built to the amount of funding that we had, not to what we thought the building ought to be. Uh, so I say probably have a reasonable need, but again, can't fund every good idea. Senior centers looking for a renovation to Tawny Town, and they'd like to enclose the back porch section of the Westminster Senior Center. Health Department looking to expand some. Now, if we do move the election board out of the current space, that could provide a way to give the Health Department some more space. I mean, it wouldn't be the same building, but it's, I mean, just feet away. Uh, then some other smaller things. There's things that are being discussed on how can we do some things, but none of these turned into capital projects. Circuit Court would like to renovate some courthouse space, like to replace the visitations, families. Family visitation. Family visitation, yeah. Uh, like to replace that. Now, the last few years, we've actually been doing a lot of improvements to the existing building, but they would still prefer a new building. And then the library. They would like a major renovation to Eldersburg, and we've even heard some rumblings of maybe they would like to just have it build a new library. Uh, renovation to North Carroll Library, renovation to Westminster Library, none of those are our projects. On North Carroll, something that might come up, the senior center used to be in the bottom of the building that the library is on, on top of. Uh, that space is not the library's. That's still yours to decide you know, wh what you want to do with it, if anything. Um, I think the library would like to be able to expand into that space, but the starting point isn't that that's their choice to, to make. With library projects, there's a pot of state funding uh, available that we've made good use of in, in Carroll County in connection with um, library projects. Uh, they made some changes in how that's distributed that led to us getting less than we were at one time, but there's still money uh, available. But uh, when we get this money, it's only a piece of the funding that would be necessary for any, any of these projects. And something that will come up in this process probably is the library saying, we'd like to go after the state money, but we need the county to say that you're interested in doing a, a project. Uh, that will be before you've finished your discussions. But if we take that up, this is one of those places where I think what you need to be thinking about is not do we want to go after the state money, but are we willing to commit the county money that's going to be necessary to get that state money? Sheriff, looking at a few things in connection with the existing detention center. Uh, annual reminder, we will need to build a new detention center someday. Uh, we've had times where we were well over capacity in the existing detention center. That's not where we are today, uh, but that's not to say it's not going to happen again someday. And it's an aging facility. If we built a, a detention center today, we would not build that. Uh, we would build in a way that would allow a smaller number of people to watch a greater number of space. We also build in a way that allows segregation of prisoners. 
uh, so that you can make better use of your space. Sometimes what we run into now is you, know, you, you have women and men have to be housed differently. Uh, you have people who are sick, people with mental health problems, and you end up inefficiently using the space, not because anybody's doing anything wrong, but it's just it, you know, what you're forced into to doing. Uh, with, with a new design, we would put ourselves in a position to be able to handle that better. Uh, when that comes, though, this is going to be an expensive project. Uh, the, may, probably the most expensive project Carroll County's ever had. Um, then it's also looking for some changes in the existing sheriff space, which is above the uh, detention center. Oh, yeah, and I, another related thing, in connection with building the state's attorney's building, there's space the sheriff is using right now in what's still called the roadway building from years ago. That building's going to have to come down, and we need to find places to put the activities that are in there. We don't have a plan for that year yet, but we're going we're gonna to have to deal with it. Uh, high level look at what's happening in the capital fund. You see 23 compared to 24, and also 23 through 28 compared to 24 through 29. Um, big change is um, how much state funding is in the mix, because there was money going into Career and Tech and East Middle School that doesn't have to go in again this time. Uh, we have you know, some of the projects we've talked about. Uh, you have some things you're doing this year that you're not last year. And more so than the operating budget, the capital budget tends to be kind of lumpy. You know, it goes up and down depending on what you happen to be doing in a given year or six years. Now the enterprise funds. So these are the capital projects associated with your enterprise funds. <clears throat> Not going to run through. Oh, yeah, and utilities is the other place where you'll see a long list of projects, and this is just just a handful of them. Uh, but again, they're they're all in here. Yeah, and one thing I should say here: this will this will come up during the your operating sessions, but it's very important to the capital. When you consider your water and sewer rates. Uh, we're not just looking at operations, we're also looking at, at, at capital projects. Uh, we need to be calculating in the cost of doing these in, into the, the, the rates that we're putting together. And uh, today's not the day, but just to say this for the first time, you know, with water and sewer, we pretty much know what the costs are. Uh, if revenue does not match the costs, all that can happen is something that needs to get done isn't getting done. There can be a, a, a lot of temptation on water and sewer rates to, to say, you know, this is going to be a burden for some people. We don't want to raise rates. Uh, can we phase this in? All those things lead to a mismatch between revenue and expenditures. And just don't want anybody ever allowing themselves to think that it won't have an impact because it will. And that's what happened last year was it was pushed off to the right for years, and then last year, it was significantly raised, as opposed to this small increments, and it walloped some people because, you know, and especially down the Freedom area, because it's a large area, um, when it comes to rates, you know, and uh, we got to own up to it when it happens, as opposed to just push it off to the right, and then the next board takes it on, because, you know, I was like, I don't know how long it was pushed off, but it was significant until we made a decision. And uh, yeah, it was that was painful. So, airport, uh, of course, there's the big runway project that doesn't actually show up in in this CIP. Right. And then there's a very small project. We have some rental money from properties that were bought bought with FAA money. Uh, we can use that for. I mean, sometimes we replace a vehicle, do some painting or. You know, little stuff. I don't remember what we have in this year, but what are we talking about? Like twenty-five thousand dollars? It's not much. Thirty-six actually now. Thirty-six. Okay. Yeah. Um, fiber network. We'll talk more about this when we get to the operating budget, but it's not a place where it touches the capital. You know, to run our network, there are there's equipment that you need that 
gets the communication from one place to another, and like other technology, needs to be replaced with regularity. When we set up this, when we set this up as an enterprise fund, uh, the thinking at that time was that the revenue we were going to generate with the excess capacity we built into it was going to cover these costs. It's become clear that that's not going to happen, and we have no prospects for that that happening. So just this year, last year, we started building this in, into our plans as, you know, it's an expenditure, it's not, it's, we, we know we need to budget for it, it can't, you can't just pretend that the enterprise fund is going to figure it out. Here's the totals on the enterprise funds. The big reason for the drop here is the money that was budgeted for Northern Landfill for, for purchasing the land and the first piece of developing it. And we'll be talking more about this, but um, again, don't want, you have, want, don't want you thinking that there's enough money budgeted now for what we're gonna have to do to develop that, that landfill. Uh, we don't know what it's going to cost yet, but it's going to be a lot more than what we have right now. Some other things that, well, I say some other things. We're going to come back to some I've talked about. But we know we have a problem with the Public Safety Training Center with chemical they call PFAs uh, getting into water. Uh, this is moving our way. Uh, we know it's there. We know we're going to have to do something. We don't know what that something is yet, so we don't know how much it's going to cost yet. But we will have to deal with it. We talked a little bit about Slacks Road. I was just talking about the Northern Landfill. Uh, the Circuit Court would like a new courtroom. Uh, this comes up every now and then. You know, they start looking to the future and saying we're going to need a new courtroom. Uh, we'd like to see some more data on how squeezed they are now before we begin planning for you know the expenditure of a, of a new courtroom. Uh, we talked some about elections and we talked a little bit about the Eldersburg Library branch. Some things to be thinking about you know, for schools, state funding, you know, how much are they going to make uh, available. And I think about this every year, but when you have a change in administration, it gets a little bit bigger for me because you just don't know mm -hmm. what's going to happen. Could be good, could be bad, but right now we don't know. I talked some about the idea of modernizations. Uh, redistricting, you know, in South Carroll, we know, well, we don't have a capacity problem in Carroll County. We do have capacity concerns in South Carroll. And there's effort right now for them to take a look at redistricting. Can that be a, a solution? In my mind, it almost has to be the solution. I, I don't know how I would come to you suggesting we build another school when we have capacity in, in the county. Uh, blueprint and pre-K, pre we talked about that a, a little bit earlier. It's not in here now, but it, it's going to be. Now the state will participate, probably, but just like full day kindergarten, it's not all it sounds like. You know, they'll say, well, that's a priority for us, but unless they increase the size of the pot to accommodate that, all it means is you got money for pre-K edition and not for some other school that you would have gotten it. Things to think about, infrastructure, we've talked about this a bit along the way. So I want to take another minute to talk, you know, real big picture on infrastructure. Uh, in the budget office, we've been working for some years to try and get our hands around what's everything we own? What's the value of all that? How much do we need on an average annual basis to be able to replace, renew all, all that infrastructure? And I say we've been working on it for years because we don't have time to just devote ourselves to doing this. So we kind of do a little bit when we can find uh, time, time to do it. And you know, it's progressing, but, it, but it's slow. But I have no doubt when we get to the end of this, what we're going to find is we are not putting, we're not budgeting enough money to actually renew all of our infrastructure. And piece by piece, we always deal with it. But I'd like to get us into a position where we have a clearer idea of where we stand. Uh, we talked about elections, talked about the health department, the roadway building. Uh, we kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, cost increases and supply chain issues are very much on our, on our minds. 
when things like this are going on, there's no way to ever know you're getting it right. All we can do is try and get it as right as we can, and then when we get more information, we, we react. Okay, um, that's the end of what I brought you about the CIP. Before I move on to bond authorization, is there anything you would like to ask or anything you'd like to talk about on that? <clears throat> It's a whole lot to uh, absorb at this point. So. And we're just starting. And we're just starting. So really good rundown. A lot of things I think that we've already highlighted uh, to each other, you know, in offices. And, um, yeah, just a lot to absorb. And like you said, just start in. And the community, you know, every one of these is a real priority to somebody out there somewhere. And uh, um, so town halls and meetings and all that kind of fun stuff will get their input as why aren't you doing this or why you know yep and that's okay I've been to community meetings in just about every part of the county and there's no part of the county that I went to who has ever said anything other than why does everybody else always get everything and we don't right. get anything and it's, it's or so I appreciate it um, now unless there's uh, comments or questions we move on to the bond uh, authorization request all right a really important idea to understand especially for the four new ones who haven't gone through this before what we're building into our plan is what drives the dollar amount we're going to request in authorization if you don't want to issue debt the time to make that decision is when we're building the plan not when we come back to get bond authorization or even worse when we go to issue the, the debt. Right. Now, once you've made these decisions, the rest of it should just flow from there. Uh, this is difficult timing. We have to give the General Assembly a number now. This is your first session. Uh, we have a lot of work to do before you, you get done. And it, it's a pain that it works this way, but this is how it works. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about what it means to get this authorization though that but just for now that itself does not commit you to anything uh, so we have you know the timing of this versus the general assembly schedule and us trying to get our budget done now some words that will get used just to make sure we're all together on what we're saying when we say appropriated that means you've adopted a budget You've actually put revenues and expenditures into a law. Those are appropriated funds, and we know, excuse me, how much you said was available and for what purpose. Authorized. This is when we go to the General Assembly and say we'd like authorization to sell debt. Um, they are passing a law that says Carroll County can sell 20 million, 40 million, 60 million dollars worth of debt this year. issued is when we actually go and sell the debt when this time comes you'll see uh, Jenny Hobbs coming to you instead of me saying okay we're ready to put this out for sale and she'll talk more about this sometime I'm sure but uh, we're very conscious about the timing of when we we sell bonds uh, first we don't want to be paying debt on bonds that we don't actually need yet and there are also what they call arbitration rules. You can't be making money on bonds that you sold as tax exempt bonds. So you have to be careful for other reasons when you sell. So a, a lot of what we issue, Jenny will actually be coming to you after the fact. We've already spent the money. Now we're gonna issue bonds and we'll reimburse ourselves. And I think, did, was she in recently with the resolution to reimburse? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you might remember she came in and this, this is why she was in. You, you gave the authority, basically, for us to spend the money knowing that we'll sell bonds later and then re reimburse what we, we spent. Okay, so appropriations don't commit you to spending money. Now, obviously, it's a clear statement of intent. We're, this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna spend the money. But it doesn't mean you can't change your, your mind. Now, once we get to that point, 
hopefully we don't change our minds for less than compelling reasons because you know, we were moving ahead for some reason. But it's important to understand, you can stop. You can say, oh, we said we're gonna do it, but now we're not. Authorized does not commit you to selling anything. All it does is say, you can sell these bonds now. You can still make a, a choice later not to. Although again, emphasize, the choice to not spend ought to be tied to, to this, not to the, the bond process. Now issued, once we issue, now that is a commitment. You have debt service, you don't get to say in a tough year, well, you know what, let's not pay the 10 million, let's pay $8 million this year. And planned, that's the other five years. Uh, it's a plan, it's, it's where, we, where we think we're going, doesn't commit you to doing anything. And it's not yet appropriated. You know, the money that you have planned for a road in the future doesn't allow that road to move forward. You have to actually get to the year where you enacted a law that says we have an appropriation for that road now. So our request this year, this is driven by what's in this plan, is $65.6 million. And this is, oh, okay, now, what we actually need will almost certainly change before we get to the end of this. Uh, you might change your mind on some, some projects. Cost estimates could change. Uh, we issue some debt on behalf of fire companies. Now, that's not it. That doesn't cost us anything, but it does change how much we'll, we'll issue. But you, do, you don't need to worry ab about those, those things. This enables us to move ahead as if this is gonna happen. Uh, if it turns out we don't need the bonds, it doesn't commit you to any action. And every now and then, this doesn't come up a lot, but sometimes we will accumulate enough authorization that didn't get used then we might come to you one year and say, we have sufficient authorization, we don't need to get any new authorization this year. And then we draw that back down and then over time that will build up again. And that happened last year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, I fell behind. So the rest of the process in March will be coming to you with an overview, which will, that's largely about revenue projections, but also some about here are things that are gonna be coming your way, things that you need to be thinking about. Uh, when we say recommendation, recommended budget, that will be for your operating budget, your capital budget, enterprise funds, uh, all the pieces. Uh, in April, you will hold a series of meetings with agencies. Uh, this will be their opportunity to come to you and say, uh, this project or this budget change was not included in management and budgets recommendation. Commissioners, we would like you to consider this. The General Assembly session ends in April, another timing problem for us. Uh, we're well into our process before the state gets done, and it's not unusual for something that matters to us to be decided on the last day of the General Assembly, uh, sometimes at 11.59 on the, on the last day. And that, that can be difficult for us. Uh, in April, you will release your proposed budget. You know, the recommended budget is me handing something to you. The proposed budget is you handing something to the public. Uh, here's where we think we're going. Public, here's your opportunity to weigh in. For anybody in the public who's listening though, you know, um, Whenever anybody asks me, well, when should I tell the commissioners what I think? I'm against this, I'm for this, you ought to do this. My answer is always now. It doesn't matter where you are in the year, now's the time. Don't wait for the public hearing. Uh, don't wait for anything to happen. Just let the commissioners know what you're thinking about. The, the earlier you have the information, the more useful it can be to you in your deliberations as you're trying to move toward a proposed and adopted, then an adopted budget. So in May, we have the public hearing. The, the public hearing is not a conversation between people and the commissioners. It's public opportunity to share in three minutes a person their thought on some aspect of, of the budget. 
and then in May we adopt the budget. That's usually 25th, 27th, 28th, something like that. But it has to be done by the last day of, of May. Okay, so if there are questions or anything you need to talk about, we can take that on now. Uh, if not, or when, when we get done, what we would need from you then is a vote to approve us requesting the bond authorization from the General Assembly. I have a question about the process. So, again, you've done all this, and today we make a motion and approve the authorization, and that goes to the delegation. Is this like a local preference bill that nobody else down there pays a whole lot of attention to? Or? Pretty much. Okay. Um, really, the only thing that would get in the way is if our delegation objected to it for some reason. Yeah. I, I guess you never know for sure. But, well, yeah, I, I do remember they used to have me come down to testify. Uh, fortunately, they stopped doing it. It, it wasn't a particularly <laughs> useful exercise. Uh, but there was a time when a committee chair said to me, well, your delegation voted against something. I forget, uh, again, maybe against the budget. And I said, that, that's true, but that's not really a, about us. But he was making a connection. Right. Uh, it did get approved, but um, scared me for a minute. Between the state <laughs> budget and, right? They voted against the state budget? Yes. Yeah. Right. So he, he was not happy that they had voted against the, the state budget and was looking to take it out on our bond authorization. Didn't happen though. Right. Any other uh, questions? Again, it's I know it's a lot to absorb um, if you have not gone through this. Um, but I will. I'll make the motion that the Board of County Commissioner approve bond authorization of sixty-five point six million dollars for FY twenty-four. Second. I got a motion. I got a second. Any further discussion on this? I'd just like to mention that I like it when you smile and nod your head after he says that. <laughs> oh, okay. It gives me confidence. <laughs> yeah. and, and the bad one is when she goes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so watch out for those. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Is that said, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Going to uh, open admin. Um, Mr. Schwam, do we have anybody on the line yes sir okay the only thing I want to share at this time and I forgot to say in prior to Carol I attended um, an event at Stratosphere down Eldersburg the um, Carroll Town Elementary School uh, community held a uh, silent auction with baskets and basically took over the entire stratosphere. And um, it was all fundraising for uh, the playground. <clears throat> it's like they figured out how to do it right. And I don't wanna say they, I mean, they're really smart. Absolute kudos to uh, Vanessa, who I think had anywhere from 50 to plus baskets in her home forever. Um, but the coordination that was done with uh, the elementary school, with the teachers, obviously, administration, but really the parents and kids. There are kids all over the place. I was there for about an hour, hour and a half, and uh, I put my tickets in a few things, so we'll see if I, I get to win or not, but um, really cool prizes. I'm looking forward to hearing how much they raised, but I saw parents dropping just, you know, 20s and 20s on their kids, and it was really exciting to see because that's how things get done uh, to me in the community. So kudos to, uh, to Vanessa, um, and I know she had a lot of uh, support, um, and I don't think she'll ever do this ever again <laughs> because it was just a, such a heavy lift. But I apologize. I, I want to say that in priority, Carol. Um, really, I, I was just impressed. So does anybody have anything else for open admin at this time? Um, just real quickly, uh, there are uh, several, I think like 15 or 17, um, either congratulatory letters uh, here for the board to sign and uh, one condolence letter for the former town councilman from Tawny Town um, uh, who recently passed away. Um, so uh, we regularly do this after election, congratulate all those who have 
one uh, in their particular offices. So just pass these okay. around if you design as you're going through agendas. Okay. Anything else? Nope. Anything else? Open admin? No. No? Mike? Hello. Open admin? Anything? Gentlemen? Okay. Come on up. Let's go through agendas. Uh, let's see. Monday, January 16th, Martin Luther in observation of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. The county offices will be closed. I believe it's also a federal holiday. On Tuesday, Planning and Zoning Commission meeting down in the uh, Reagan room. Commissioner Gordon will be attending at 9 a.m. At 10 a.m., I will have one of two town hall meetings down in the uh, senior South Carroll Senior Center at 10 a.m. till about 12. Don't mess with their bingo or their lunch is what you learn very quickly down there. At 2 p.m., a Veterans Advisory meeting. Uh, Commissioner Gordon and Kyler will be in attendance. And at 6 p.m., um, the Farm Bureau Annual Legislative Dinner will occur uh, over at Burns Hall. At the Ag Center, Commissioner Gordon Gurin, Kyler, and Viglia will be attending. Um, and I will be having my second of the two town hall meetings that evening at 6.30. On Wednesday is Governor Westmore swearing in ceremony. You're attending? Yes. Okay, Commissioner Gordon is uh, attending. Um, and there will be a legislative committee meeting virtually being held um, at 10 a.m. Talk to you about that because we may if you want, go down there into uh, Mike Fowler's office and do that. Um, and this way we're down there, but we can have that conversation. Good. Um, 7 p.m., Board of Education, FY24 operating budget hearing will occur. Uh, I don't think it's necessary for anybody to be in attendance, but it's scheduled at the Board of Education boardroom. Um, at 7 p.m. Uh, is the Emergency Services Advisory Council or ESAC meeting um, over at the Training Center and Commissioner Guerin will be attending. On Thursday, we will go into open session at 10 a.m., not 9. We will have, we'll be doing an administrative session from 8 to 10 and we'll go into open session at 10 a.m. From that point, we have, uh, let's see, grant application acceptance of award for restoration projects uh, will be discussed from Mr. Hine. Um, Public Safety Training Center stormwater retrofit. Again, land resource management will present. Then DPW will present the FY24 annual transportation plan. Uh, there'll be, DPW will talk about insulating Installing, excuse me, pole lighting at the Carroll County Farm Museum. And then they will ask to be purchasing an FY, no, excuse me, a uh, 2022 Ford F-250. On Friday at 9 a.m. is a virtual meeting for the Baltimore Metropolitan Council that I will be attending. Saturday, nothing scheduled, and Commissioner Kyler has the podcast on the 22nd. Nothing scheduled on the 23rd. On the 24th, okay, is a point in time or pit count. And it's um, what it is is um, walking the county, looking at uh, where homeless and encampments uh, are in place. So it's uh, uh, run by Citizen Services. I will be attending with uh, Commissioner Kyler. Um, just wear shoes that you're willing to go into the woods on. So, um, Wednesday, January 25th, Commission of Aging on, uh, excuse me, Commission on Aging meeting and luncheon. Commissioner Vigliotti will be attending over at the Westminster Senior Center. There will be a 3.30 p.m. Uh, Maryland Association of Counties or MACO Legislative Committee meeting down in Annapolis. 
where Commissioner Kyler and I will attend, and then there will be a legislative reception that uh, evening, where again, Commissioner Kyler and I will be attending down in Annapolis. Thursday, again, open session, once again, starts at 10 a.m. Uh, we'll have a economic development and land use study presented by um, Ms. Eisenberg. Um, then a briefing and request to go to public hearing for rezoning oh, uh, in the Eldersburg Investors LLC. Again, Ms. Uh, Planning will present that. Then we'll look to uh, for approval of FY24 grant application award of acceptance from the L Rural Legacy Program where L Land Resource Management will present. That afternoon at 1 p.m., we will reconvene for the Environmental Advisory Council annual joint meeting and proposed FY23 work plan. And that will be held, it's a joint meeting with us, and it'll be held down in the Reagan Room and the environment, uh, Environmental Advisory Council. Uh, Friday, nothing scheduled. Saturday, nothing scheduled. And Commissioner Gordon has the podcast on Sunday, January 29th. Did I miss anything, Ms. Wanda? Nothing else? Or open admin. What I need is a motion to recess to go into close for land acquisition. Make a motion to go into recess. A motion to go into close for land acquisition. For land acquisition. Land acquisition. Yeah, sorry, this. Okay. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay. <laughs> I got a motion and a second to go into recess, to go into uh, close for land acquisition. All in favor? Aye. 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 Now I need a motion to adjourn after uh, the closed. Make a motion to adjourn after the closed. Second. I got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.